Okay, members, um, we'll make a start and declare the meeting open to the public. I'll just give anyone that's here a minute to come through. Just to remind members, if you can have your mobile devices on airplane mode and keep them away from the mic so they don't interfere with the broadcast. And we're going to have um, two oral evidence sessions, and if members are content, we'll have hands hard recording them both. Agreed. Um, again, uh, if there's any interests that members need to declare uh, related to this meeting, now is the opportunity to do it. If not, we will proceed. Um, have we any apologies? I think Mr. McCartney's due to be with us shortly, and uh, I know Pat Sheehan has to, to leave slightly earlier. If members are content then we move on to the draft minutes of the meeting that were held on the 23rd of January and if you're content that they're a true reflection of the proceedings of that meeting then I'll uh, sign them unless there's any amendments that need to be made. Members agreed with their accuracy? Agreed. I have no matters arising from it, um, so unless members have, then we'll proceed to the overview briefing on access to justice. And if I could invite the team of officials to come forward. Um, members, the pages relevant to this are pages 15 to 25 of your meeting pack. And rather than me introduce the entire team, um, I let Anthony as the director to introduce your colleagues and then that'll keep us all right. So Anthony, you're very welcome and I'll let you introduce your team and, and provide an overview for us and then we'll have some questions. Thank you, Chair. It's nice to be back. Um, as the Chair said, my name is Anthony Harmson, Director of Access to Justice. With me today are my colleagues Linda Hamilton, Head of the Gillen Review Implementation Team and EU Exit Division, Lynn Kepper, Head of Justice Performance, and Lorraine McAlpine, Head of Civil Justice. If it's permissible, I'd like to make a short statement in terms of where we are, what we're doing, and then hopefully that will generate some questions. And yes, please. Take it from there. Uh, unfortunately, I should say that Brian Jimmick, the Head of Criminal Justice, is out of the country, but as he's skiing, he may not see that as unfortunate. He might see that as uh, a welcome break. But we do welcome the opportunity to meet with the committee today and provide an update and overview of the key issues on which we are advising the Minister. I don't want to take up all of the committee's time with my statement, as I realise you'll have your own questions, but I would like to focus on the most important issues and the outcomes we want to deliver. To start with, I should say that you will have already heard across the Department that our purpose is to deliver for Northern Ireland, a safer community where we respect the law and each other. We're also driven by the Department's corporate objectives, particularly around embedding a culture of lawfulness, delivering an effective justice system and securing confidence in the justice system. To make those aspirations more than words involves identifying and tackling the challenges across a complex justice machinery, the major elements of which are both independent and interdependent. So, what are the key challenges that we are going to be looking at? Well, firstly, I'd like to deal with speeding up justice. This is one of the biggest challenges facing the justice system and is a priority for the Department. As Criminal Justice Partners and the Criminal Justice Board, the speed that cases progress uh, matters to victims, matters to witnesses, matters to their families and, of course, to the actual accused themselves and it can help offenders to better understand the implications of their actions. Reducing the time it takes to complete the criminal cases is challenging and complex issue and reforms take time to embed and for their impacts to be seen. A speeding up justice programme involving all the key justice organisations is taking us forward under four strands, performance reporting, working in partnership, legislation and research and analysis. Reforming the committal process is an important element of improving the speed of the system as specifically noted in the new decade, new deal, our new approach deal. A draft committal reform bill 
with provisions to make further attempt to abolish all evidence at committal in line with the Fresh Start panel's recommendations. Is at an advanced stage and we plan to engage with you shortly to take this forward. Another key area of business is the implementation of Sir John Gillan's review of law and procedures in serious sexual offences. We have established a team to take this forward along with Cross Agency Strategic Justice Sexual Harm Group to provide governance in this area and to ensure that there is a coherent and coordinated approach to addressing sexual violence across all justice bodies in Northern Ireland. In relation to implementation of the review, we have been working with stakeholders to consider the 253 recommendations and 16 key recommendations, and we are developing an implementation plan which highlights key work streams and priorities to take this work forward. We are committed to a victim-centred approach and improving the experiences of the criminal justice system in serious sexual violence cases. In the criminal justice space, we also expect to bring forward up to four bills in the two remaining years of the mandate to deal with particular areas of concern to the Minister. Domestic violence and stalking legislation, I have already mentioned committal reform, and we also would like to progress a miscellaneous provisions bill to bring forward necessary legislative housekeeping changes that have been building up during the absence of the Assembly. Further, a major review of sentencing policy in Northern Ireland will complete its public consultation stage next month and is likely to generate new legislation in the next mandate. We have also been working across the Department on policy relating to legacy of the past and have been closely involved with shaping the Department's contribution to the several rounds of political talks on legacy and contributed to the rounds of discussions on leg legislation covering the form and function of the justice-related Stormont House Agreement institutions. <coughs> Problem-solving justice is also something which the Department has been championing for some time. As you may be aware, this is a new approach aimed at tackling the root causes of offending behaviour, reducing harm and addressing vulnerabilities within families and the community. The Department, in partnership with other government departments and agencies and the voluntary and community sector, has developed a portfolio of problem-solving justice projects. These include, for example, support hubs, the Substance Misuse Court, and the Enhanced Combination Orders, or ECOs, as they are often referred to. The Committee may also be interested to know that over the past few months, we have been developing a digital justice strategy, and this will be due for completion at the end of March this year. Regarding civil justice, as the Committee may know, the substantive civil law, such as divorce and property law, is the responsibility of the Department of Finance. The Department of Justice is, however, responsible for policy on structure and jurisdiction of the civil and family courts and tribunals. At least as many people come into contact with the justice system through civil and family disputes than do through the criminal justice system. It is essential, therefore, that we have an effective civil and family <coughs> justice system which is cost-effective, proportionate and efficient, and in which citizens have confidence. Many of the civil and family justice initiatives which we are taking forward are informed by Lord Justice Gillan's review of civil and family justice systems, on which he reported in September 2017, with almost 400 recommendations. Specific policies on which we have been working include legislation to prohibit the victim or alleged victims of domestic abuse from being directly cross-examined by the alleged perpetrator of the abuse in family court, a consultation on the general jurisdiction of the county courts. Currently, the county court can hear a case where the amount is claimed up to 30,000. Lord Justice Gillen, in his review of civil justice, recommended that the limit should be increased to 60,000, and there may be a case for going even higher, perhaps up to 100,000. We're also looking at the settlements of claim involving minors where no legal proceedings have issued and a single family court. We expect to work up proposals on these issues during this assembly. Civil justice colleagues will also lead on the justice aspects of Mental Capacity Act 2016, some of which has now been commenced and on which, going forward, we will be working with colleagues and colleges in the Department of Health. Finally, it would be more than remiss not to say something about Brexit. 
As the committee will be aware, the UK's exit from the EU poses particular challenges for justice. Preparation for the exit on a no-deal footing were well developed and can be revived should that prove necessary. Otherwise, our focus is on ensuring that the UK Government's planning for negotiations on the future security, future security partnership takes proper account of Northern Ireland's requirements and our devolution settlement. Key challenges in the coming month will be the ability to secure successor measures to the EU Justice and Home Affairs tools, especially as this is set against the UK Government's intention not to extend the implementation period. Of particular importance to us will be to ensure the effective extradition and data sharing arrangements are secured to enable continued effective daily cooperation between the PSI, PSNI and Angarda Shikana. The practical implementation of the NI protocol will also have implications for justice and security. I am happy to tell the Committee that our access to and engagement with the Home Office, who lead on most of the justice issues, has been positive. We are also very closely engaged with justice colleagues in Dublin, and discussions on cross-border issues are regularly brought forward and are very productive. It is difficult in a short space of time to do justice to the breadth of the, and the depth of the work that we are taking forward, and in particular the challenges in some cases. But no doubt the panel or the committee will have plenty of questions, so at that point I will hand over to you yourself. Thank you, Anthony, um, for taking us briefly over the general areas of responsibility that you have in your directorate. Just a couple of quick <coughs> questions for me for clarity. Domestic abuse legislation. Um, Minister obviously made that announcement, uh, which I have welcomed. What is the time frame for putting it through the executive and then subsequently bringing it to the Assembly? Thank you. Well, we want to ensure that the legislation uh, deals with those affected by violent and non-violent abuse behaviour and that they are all afforded protection. Uh, the planned timescale is that we anticipate that the bill could be introduced to the Assembly by April or May of this year. We would then hope that it would get <coughs> royal assent by April or May of 2021, and then, given all the time to put it into operation, that it would be operational around April to May 2022. Okay. Um, and the stocking legislation, if I can just have clarity on that, that it will be a separate piece of legislation, uh, yes. or it will be. Yes. Um, and it, similarly, then the, the time frame for when that plans to come to the assembly. We've uh, done the consultation work on this. Uh, drafting and finalisation of the bill is expected to be completed round. June, July of this year, and hopefully be brought to the Assembly in the autumn. Okay. Um, the, the other bills then that we've, you've mentioned, the committal reform and also the miscellaneous um, bill, particularly the miscellaneous one, given that that's an opportunity for a considerable amount of amendments to come forward, and that would be within the scope of the bill. Yes. But what, what, what's the time frame for the introduction of the miscellaneous bill? Uh, we're still trying to work out exactly what we would put into it, but um, by May of this year, uh, we're hoping to begin the, our complete the drafting, and we would expect that it would be sorry to begin the uh, drafting, and we'd hope to have that ready by the end of the year and bring it forward next year. It's bearing in mind. We don't have a lot of time in this mandate, so we don't getting through four pieces of legislation, one of which will be broad in nature, will be challenging. It will. We we fully understand that, and we would hope that we would work closely with the committee to shorten as many of the stages as possible to take it through. But obviously, the passage will be dependent on the work of this committee, and it will go at the speed that you wish it to go at. But. We do want to try and use the next two years as much as we can to push through that legislation. Well, the sooner we get it, yes, then we are able to start the work on our side, which I'm sure we, we will we will do in as timely a fashion as possible. Mm. Um, just in, in terms of the legacy, I asked this of the, the permanent secretary last week. Have we any further update as to the provisions that are contained within the 
the new decade, new approach as to what that means by way of consenting mechanism of this assembly? Unfortunately not. We still haven't heard anything directly from the NIO on that. Has there been any engagement with um, Westminster in respect of the legacy, the legislation that's due to be introduced within 100 days as of a number of weeks ago? Uh, there has been no update from the Permanent Secretary's discussions with you last week. Okay. Um, in terms of the historical institutional abuse, the Redress Board, yes. uh, progress in terms of it being established, uh, I know the Head of the Civil Service has mentioned this at TEO, uh, are we on, on course to get that up and running as soon as possible? Yes, um, Peter Looney, who also falls within the command, will be up before you, I think, next week and can explain that in some detail. But we have the presiding judge appointed. We have the county court judges identified. The Department of Health are filling the gaps then with the lay and the medical <coughs> representation. And I believe the hope is that the process will begin in April with the first cases being heard in May. And is DOJ the kind of the, the lead department on, on with, this? We're the lead for the operation for the of the procedures board, office? yes, but actually the policy intent sits with TEO. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Linda? I have, I have a number of questions. I suppose the HIA was one of the first ones, but that's dealt with. Um, just in terms of... Justice Gillan's recommendations, and I know obviously that falls within within your remit. And uh, mm -hmm. just could we get maybe rather than ask you to go, there are quite a number of recommendations, mm -hmm. obviously, and they're not all in, in terms of, of yourselves. So some are for PSN and other mm -hmm. other bodies. But in relation to that, would there be a possibility of us getting some type of a, a report? I think there was a report to be given to the parties prior to Christmas and then of the election that didn't happen. Right. Just. Really, what I would like to know is where each recommendation is at. You know, has it been implemented? Does it require policy change? Does it require legislative change? Or is it not doable for whatever reason? So, yeah. just so we can get a, a grasp of where we're at with all those recommendations. Yeah, so I think what might be helpful for the committee, and I'm happy to, to take that forward, is to actually have a look at how we propose to implement it. So, perhaps the way forward is not necessarily looking at it recommendation by recommendation because Sir John himself will talk about the totality of that and how complex the system is and how these things are interrelated. So without going through a, a, a recommendation by recommendation approach, I think what, what I've um, tried to do um, since I took up post is to get those big multi-agency bits, so the bits that are going to have the highest impact, the greatest impact on those going through the system. To, put, to make sure that those are the things that we are prioritising. So some of those will be practical uh, processes that operational partners um, will take forward, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure you'll be speaking to, to them about that. But some of them will also be legislative, um, and some of them uh, will uh, require a bit of thought as to how to, to phase those. So, for example, Sir John talks um, about pre-recorded cross-examination and that, you know, the ability of... A complainants to give evidence before a trial in a, a, a safe and supportive environment. In order to do that, there are some stages before then that you would need to focus on to make sure that things like disclosure are in the place that they need to be to, to, to then roll that out. So I'm quite happy to, um, to give the committee a, a sense of where we are with that implementation, which will obviously become more detailed as the work progresses, if that would be helpful. Yeah, no, that, that would be... Perfect. Um, it's just to get an idea of where it's at and, and what's sure. happening with it. Um, also, then, just in relation to the county court, you had said obviously you're you're doing that work piece of work. Where where is it at at the minute? I mean, obviously there's a review really ongoing. So, at what stage are we at? How is that likely to happen anytime soon? Or what? We have a, a very well advanced draft consultation paper. Um, we will probably want to wash that through the Shadow Civil Justice Council just to stress test it and fact check it before we put it up to the Minister, um, or at least before we bring it to this committee. But I would hope to get that out for publication, um, possibly before the summer. Okay. Just my last question then, in relation to the legacy mechanisms and the, the HIU, obviously, which comes under yourself. And 
understand where the chair is coming from in relation to what's happening with it and have the NAO. But there were discussions with the Justice Department before about preparatory work that could be done mm. in terms of, I know the Ombudsman's office had offered at one stage, I don't know if that offer still stands, obviously we have a new Ombudsman in place, to train staff up because it is going to take a number of years to get the HIU up and running even whenever the legislation is implemented. And that work would also help to get the workload that is sitting on the Ombudsman's office moved on so that whenever the HIU comes into existence it won't have that, that backlog. So has there been anything done in terms of trying to do some preparation work and ensuring that when the leg if the legislation ever comes through that they're ready to, to go, that we have at least some people trained and unable to, to start? In my previous role as head of uh, Safer Communities, um, I've begun that work because if the HIU comes, it'll be more on the policing side of the, the house and we will be dealing with it there. Hence, the reason I began a process of groundwork to see what would be needed, so things such as IT, HR, premises, IT systems, but also numbers of staff and stuff like that. So. We hired a um, professional advisor to start looking at those sorts of areas and talking to them. So work has progressed in certain areas on that, but without the legislation, it's very, very difficult to know where the boundaries are and the numbers of cases that we would be reviewing and how hard that would take. But certainly the groundwork, which I think will save a considerable uh, amount of time at the start-up, has been uh, commenced. Yeah, I understand that, Anthony, but the fact is that the most difficult thing that's going to be is getting re people recruited, actually, yes, it is. physical human beings, in order to, to carry out the investigation. Mm. So, I mean, that's what's going to really take the greatest length of time. I mean, to get premises and all of that has to be done, I understand, but I think that the people is going to be the, the biggest difficulty. So, the Ombudsman's Office did make that offer. Is there no you know, no thinking within the Justice Department that that's something worth taking up because there's a massive backlog within the Ombudsman's office. Anyhow, so even without the HIU, that will be of assistance to the... Again, at the moment, what we have been hoping for and waiting for is release of the initial $150 million that was ring-fenced under the Stormont House Agreement. Um, we haven't had access to that, so it's very difficult at this stage to move forward recruiting and hiring people, especially as we don't know how many when they would start, when the HIU would become operative. So when money is made available and we have some targets, I think we would look at all options to move forward quickly. But we are in a bit of a vacuum at the moment until we get to that. Um, thank you. Paul Frey. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, thank you very much uh, for your attendance here today. And it's great to see you around a committee table again. And um, I just say <coughs> I've been aware of the work that you guys have been doing in the lean period. Uh, and the work and stress you guys have been under uh, without a minister in place. So, uh, you know, I want to just mark that appreciation of the work you've been doing, Thank all you. of you. I know, Linda, you're I can't take credit for in, that. <laughs> in post, and it was good to meet you at the All Party yeah. Working Group that day, and I wish you all the best in your role. Thank you. Can I ask about the... Uh, just, just on your yeah. role, and I, I, I may be confused, uh, not trying to trip anybody up, but are you in the right place with regards to the... The, the structure, because it seems to be you're down on the list as safer communities, not access to justice. No, it's access to justice. If it's saying anything else, that's a mistake, and right, we'll okay. have that corrected. Right, OK. Uh, and you're also in charge of, or, or partly charged with uh, EU exit. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, Lorraine, your Brexit legal aspects. What's the difference? No, I, well, I had some responsibility for the no deal Brexit legislation right, okay. that's um, concluded now. So I have some ongoing interest in the civil aspects mm. of Brexit because there are implications for uh, the enforcement of civil judgments cross border and family cases. Um, but uh, Linda has the, the lion's share of the Brexit work. Okay. Uh, Two meaty subjects, yep. uh, Linda, uh, so I wish you all the best on that. Uh, probably my main focus on questioning today will be on the domestic violence legislation piece. Anthony, you know my form on this over the yes. years. 
Um, and it strikes me as your target dates may well be slightly unambitious. Uh, surely we knew what we were going to do at the department before Stormont fell. Uh, the legislation was good to go, we thought then. Uh, why can we not just pick that up again? Because although we have a time difference now, the situation and the subject hasn't changed. Is so this in terms of domestic violence? Domestic violence bill, sorry. Right. Why, why are we waiting? Why, why do we have to wait April, May uh, before it's first reading, I think you said? Well, the bill was pretty much good to go three years ago, but a lot has changed in three years and things have moved forward. Like what, sorry? Like uh, developments in other jurisdictions where we've looked and said maybe that's a better idea and maybe that's a better way of doing that, like the various uh, various orders that can be put in place to prevent uh, an accused perpetrator from making contact with the family, from getting involved with the individual. We put a lot of time and effort into working on transferring or at least making sure that the UK bill that would have come through would have fit it with Northern Ireland. So, for example, in the original legislation that we had, we didn't have a definition of course of control in the same way we weren't making defence. We're now moving all of that forward. So what we're now doing is looking at the work that we put into the English bill and making sure that we put that firmly into what we have. We, have, we do hope to do it quickly, mm -hmm. but um, we're just working with draftsmen and all the rest of it to make that happen. And obviously, every department is back at once, and everybody's trying to do the same with their pieces of legislation. And that's what scares me, hence my question. <coughs> is there a danger here that whilst we had a bit of, of, uh, of a bell ready to go, we now could be somewhere along the queue uh, with regards to assembly business, and we may well lose time that way. Robert. No, I don't think so. I mean, I've just actually talked to um, the head of the OLC on the way out there, Brenda, mm -hmm. and she has said that we are good to go with these bills, and she's happy to work with us. So she wants them quickly, and we're trying to bring them to her as quickly as possible. You say April, May this year, uh, first reading, and then Royal Assent next year. Next year, this at, at April, yes. May. That's a full year. Well, if the, that's the normal process. If we can do it quicker with uh, the committee and the assembly so much, the better. That's just the normal time scale that it would take. And then a further year for operation. Well, we, we have to make sure that whatever we legislate for, that we actually have the systems in place that actually make it work. So yes, but there will be money and there will be processes and there will be systems need to be put in place. What, what systems do you foresee? I'm, trying, I'm struggling to see how the police wouldn't be geared up for this. Well, the police wouldn't necessarily be geared up to have specifically trained uh, officers. They do, of course, have specifically trained uh, domestic violence teams, mm -hmm. but there will be new prevention orders coming through. They would need to be understood and rolled out to all police officers, how they work, how they're administered, how they engage with people when they come on a domestic, set, domestic incident and they're trying to work out where people should be or not be at any point in time. And that would take a year after our assent and two years after first reading? As I say, that's the initial timescale. We would hope to do everything much more quickly than that, but that's the general view at the moment in terms of rolling them out, having things like helplines in place, having working with the community and voluntary sector as well for the bits that are there. Some things will be in place from day one, it will be much quicker. Other things will just take more time to put into operation. It's just I think the stakeholders out there in the victims group, their dilemma over the last number of weeks has been, well, if we go Westminster, mm. we get it quicker. So time is a massive yes. factor for them. Of course, we believe that it should be going through the Assembly Chamber and we can shape it to, the, to what we think best suits Northern Ireland. Uh, but for victims group, they just want to see results, of course. and it's, for them, time is a massive issue. Yes. Um, so I, I would push you on that if, if we could see that as soon as possible. I will work with the team directly. They're not within my uh, area because the actual um, policy area sits within safer communities. Yes. But I will certainly look to see how we can do that. Final questions. Uh, 
Redress Board, you, yes. you say that you are in charge or, or respons we are responsible as the Department for the operation of yes. that. The policy sits with the Executive Office. Who pays for it? Executive Office. Even the operational costs? Well, there will be a transfer to us for running it in the same way as we run other uh, tribunals, and there would normally be a transfer of money for that as well. And that works smoothly, does it? Well, I'm hoping it does. I don't expect the Department of Justice to be picking up the costs from existing budgets. It would have to come with new resources, which would come through the policy side of that. You know what it's been like in the past? I do, but um, I've been reassured that that money is uh, not in question and will come. That would worry me, a shared burden, or, or you know, so a department relying on some other department to, to control its destiny would really worry me. That's something I think we need to keep an eye on. Sure. Thank you. Thank yes. you very much for your time. And I just wanted to pick up on domestic abuse for yeah. completeness. Yeah, it just, it just was a quick question that kind of ties in with what Paul was saying. I understand that it will take time for the PSNA to get, get a grasp of this, but I think maybe that the department needs to look at do the PSNA use effectively even the powers that they currently have? Because that's the concern that I'm getting from um, stakeholders and, and victims groups, that they don't believe that the PSNA are prop properly or effectively using the powers that they do have. Now, whether that's that they're not being trained correctly or whether they're not getting the right information or there's a misunderstanding of what, how the law, as it stands, works. But there is an issue there where, where the PSNA are not effectively using what is already at their disposal. So when we bring this legislation through, we need to be very certain that it is actually going to be used in an effective way because all of that hard work will be of no avail if it's not effectively used. So there needs to be a bit of work, I think, done with the PSNA in relation to that and you know, with the, with the Chief Constable preparation of it. We'll move on to the next one. Is there anyone else wants to comment on the domestic abuse piece? Just to wrap that up. If not, then Rachel Wood. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much for coming to committee this afternoon. I have a couple of questions. Uh, with regard to the sentencing policy review, I note that there's a number of public engagement events that have been taken have taken place and a number for planned for January. Could you tell me what they look like, who they're with, and uh, whereabouts they're taking place? Uh, yes, if I can find the piece of paper on that. And I certainly will. Um, the consultation on the Department's review of sentencing will close on the 3rd of February. Uh, as you know, individual sentencing cases are a matter for the judiciary. However, the Department is responsible for the provision of an appropriate framework. In terms of the specific questions, the review team has met with academics, retired judge, senior members of victim support, PBNI and NIACRO, they're all the groups of experts that we've been dealing with going forward. It has been a significant review and the board that's doing this is made up of senior officials. A number of pre-consultation events were held during the development phase and uh, the focus on specific elements of the review and we brought in the specific uh, stakeholders who we thought were relevant at that point in time. We also met individually with political representatives, victims, offenders, and we've attended the stakeholder meetings. We've redesigned the crime survey to get more meaningful questions on this particular issue. The consultation itself is seeking views on the purpose and principles of sentencing, the public perceptions, our approach to sentencing guidance, the tariff setting, the arrangements for challenging unduly lenient sentences, which you will know is probably one of the single biggest issues there. And there are a number of areas where the public have raised concerns, such as death by dangerous driving, attacks on elderly people and blue light services, and of course hate crime, and we have a review of hate crime also underway. Um, the six public engagements events have taken place. After consultation closes on the 3rd, the Minister's team will then um, analyse the responses and provide both the Minister and the Committee with the report on those responses mm -hmm. and then any proposed changes will be discussed with yourselves as well at that point and we'll take it forward from there. Thank you very much. Um, second question is on the Mental Capacity Act. There's a suggestion in one of the lines that there would be 
matters relating to powers for police officers to take an individual to a place of safety if they appear to be in immediate need of care or control. Uh, what does that look like? Let Lorreen take that one. Um, I think it's to deal with a situation where a member of the public is maybe behaving in a, a, an extremely dangerous way, perhaps in a, a, a public place, Shaftesbury Square, with um, perhaps even holding some sort of knife or weapon, and it's a, to allow uh, police officers to uh, detain that person and take them to a place of safety, which would be uh, a hospital or, or possibly a police station. It's really to deal with the idea that the person might be of harm to themselves or harm to others, but more usually to themselves, and it's trying to get them to a place of safety as opposed to taking them into a police cell and a custody cell. It's, 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 it's much more about trying to get them the right treatment at the right time. And whose assessment would that be? Would that be a police officer on the ground that would make I, that decision? would say yes, that it's an operational decision and I don't think they would be looking for somebody back office trying to second guess what's happening on the street. Okay, thank you. And just finally on the Stormont House Agreement issue, I know it's been brought up a couple of times today. Um, I note that political parties um, have been written that we were mentioned to be engaged with and the outcome of the consultation and the key concerns that have been raised. Um, are, do you have any idea about what those key concerns are and that to confirm that all political parties will be engaged with this process? My understanding is that the NIO is obviously taking this forward and they have been engaging with uh, all of the political parties going forward. We fed in in terms of political parties asking us for updates on what we think the implications might be for the devolved institutions. But really, I don't have any further insight into that. All right, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Doug? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, Andy, thank you for that. I mean, it's very clear. I mean, you've got some really chunky and sizable pieces of work to be done there. And, you know, when I look at that speeding up justice and the Gillen Review and domestic violence and sentencing. Um, so there's, there's huge pieces of work there. But I guess for me, all of this stems from the speeding up justice piece, because if we don't speed up the justice, all of those other pieces will be left in the quagmire so people won't get justice in a timely timely manner. Could I just ask, and I think it's yourself, Glenn, how, how, we're, how we're getting on with that speeding up justice, the committal pr process, and, and when can we sort of, sort of see the fruits of your labour? Okay. Um, I think to, to, to kick off, as Anthony said, it's a, it's a really important issue um, for victims and witnesses and, 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 and many folk. Um, it's also a really complex issue. Uh, but it's a priority for the department and for the Criminal Justice Board, um, and the, the relevant justice organisations are working um, really collaboratively to take this forward. Um, we, we've done a lot of work um, over the past couple of years. Um, we've established a, a new team to give us a new focus, and we've put more resources to it. Um, I can give you some examples of the things we've tried to do to, to speed up the system, and then we'll talk about some of the numbers. Um, so we've put an awful, lot of, an awful lot of effort into improving our performance reporting. So we're able to, to drill down into specific types of cases and specific areas of the process um, so that we can target where we need to fix. Uh, in 2017, we introduced the Indictable Cases process, um, which is a new way to uh, handle cases to try and get a more effective and efficient investigation and prosecutorial um, process. Um, and we're starting to see the fruits of that. Um, we've, we're just about to... to publish uh, an evaluation of that um, and I think that's going to show that those cases are, are going about 25% quicker than similar cases so there's, there's progress there and there's lots of examples of, of people working together um, for example we've established what we're calling crime court cases performance groups um, which are judicial led groups judicial chaired groups in various regions around the country um, and those bring together judges police prosecution um, and defence lawyers to try and work out what are the particular localised problems in, in different areas. So there's lots going on. In terms of uh, the, the numbers, um, we publish internal management information every quarter. It's provisional until um, the statisticians um, formally publish those. But for example, up to the end of December, on our provisional management information, the average time taken to complete a case from uh, the police stage until the disposal at court um, was sitting at 153 days. Um, and that's the quickest average speed we've seen since about mid-2016. So hopefully we're progressing in the right direction. Um, we know, however, there are some particular types of cases 
um, that aren't um, going in the right direction, and we need to target those. So I suppose that to sum all that up, there's lots of effort has gone under this. There's continuing effort going into it, um, but we're starting to see that the average speed of cases um, in general is, is moving in the right direction. And, and, I mean, it is incredibly important. It nearly underpins everything. I mean, if you, look at, if you look at the figures for our prison population, there's so many in remand in there. Mm. So I guess we're on a bit of a catch-up with that as well. And I suppose we all want to see less prisoners in remand for, for less periods of time and getting them through the, the system very quickly. So, I mean, for me, it's, a, it's, a, it's incredibly uh, important. And I do just want to register my, my slight concern, Anthony, about the domestic um, violence legislation not being operational till 2022. I, I mean, that... For me, I thought it was a bit of a stretch out, I've got to say. I don't understand your reasons mm. why, but for me, I'm just a little bit concerned about that. And I think, I think stakeholders will be concerned, and yes. I think it just needs to be registered, and, 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 and I think you've explained that very well. Um, but, but, Andy, over the last three years, we, we have continued to, to engage. I know you were responsible for the action plan on tackling paramilitarism, organised crime and criminality. Yes. Um, I, I mean, and that's still going on as we speak. Um, it, is there any way of getting a, a back brief for this um, for, for this committee who may not have sat on some of our subgroups that we've been doing over the last three years on how that's progressing? Yes, uh, I'm no longer responsible no, for that, but I am sure that Julie Harrison, who has taken up that role, will be more than happy to provide it. I'll, I'll ask her and we'll arrange for that to be given out to all the members of the committee. Um, and then just... just um, well, two more actually, because I'm really interested on that mental, um, the Mental Health Capacity Act that's, mm. that's coming in, and we talked about the police officer being able to do, to take an individual and take them to a place of of safety. But I'm really interested then what the process is. And if we're saying that place of safety is a hospital, is there a handover procedure then going to be put in place where the hospital staff take over that vulnerable? Person, or does the police then have to stay with that vulnerable person there? Um, you know, probably know I'm referring to the case of of the Cardry, um uh, double murder where, where that's exactly what happened but then the police left the, the individual who then left and, and then murdered two people. So when we look at this this Mental Capacity Act and taking this individual to a place of safety, is there going to be safeguards in that which both protect the, the, the health workers who may have to take this man on but also the police who can't just stay with them all? Uh, I mean I'm absolutely sure there must be and there'll be uh, medical involvement in that process but I can't give you the detail on that. Um, this afternoon, but I'll be happy to write to the committee with more on how this actually works if someone is um, detained under these place of safety powers. What are the next steps for that person? Yeah, I mean, you just have a little bit of detail. Yeah. I think yeah. we just, we just, Understand. if we can have it, just mm -hmm. for a better understanding. I'm sure it's, it's, it's covered off, but it's a better understanding for myself. Um, and the very last point, if I can. Um, and you, you talked about the groundwork on, on, on the HIU. I, I, yes. I fully understand why you have to do that groundwork on the HIU. But, but I think Linda made, made a really, really good point here about people. Yes. Uh, and we know that qualified homicide investigators um, may not be as readily available as, as we probably think to allow this thing to happen. Uh, has the department, who are going to re be responsible for recruitment, looked at where they're going to get this volume of, of homicide qualified uh, investigators for any HIU? Well, we have looked at the range of people that you would need. Not everyone will be a homicide investigator. I mean, there will be researchers, there will be investigators, there will be people who will be looking through back records and taking all of that forward. So there's a complete range of individuals as well as those who have warranted powers to go and take people in and question them and do all of that. So yes, we've been looking at the different categories of staff that you would need. We haven't and can't really move forward in the absence of some HIU legislation. And that's really where we're waiting to see the 100 days, what the policy is that's coming out, what the time frame is, what the number of cases are going to be, and who has the determination over that. Is it the director or is it someone else? We don't know at this point in time. And I, and I can see the, the catch-22 position you're in, uh, Anthony, in, in regards to this, because you have to wait for the legislation to come out. Mm. But if they bring out a legislation, which you then turn around and say, well, I can't meet that because I cannot get these qualified staff for that. So is, is there not that two-way flow where you have to be able to say, look, you know, I mean, to investigate a, a, a murder, you, you have to have that qualification. You know, um, and I know there's other pieces that help with that, collators and, and office staff, I get that. But to investigate the, the, the killing, you have to be a homicide qualified investigator. Uh, and if we're saying we can't get 300, surely that should be informing the NIO. Certainly, we 
been explaining some of the operational difficulties both to political parties in our briefing and to the NIO in terms of the capacity to find investigators as well as others. But yes, we have been actually making sure people understand that this will not be a quick process in terms of setting them up. However, it depends how quickly you want to be operational. You could be operational with a small number of teams quite quickly, and then you would build up more as you go through and work your way through that. But those are real concerns, genuine concerns. They are issues, but until we see the legislation, it's, it's hard for us to go much further than we've already done. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Raymond McCartney. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I, I have a couple of questions around the, the, the Mental Capacity Act. Uh, the, the first is a sort of general question. Uh, I, I was on the committee that, that, mm. that, 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 and it was taken through the House. Uh, it says here was partially commenced on the 2nd of December 2019. Was that an inordinate length of time or is that just a... Uh, no, I, I don't think so. I mean, it was commenced in respect of deprivation of liberty applications. Um, there is a significant part of the Act which still remains to be commenced. Yep. And as you know, this was a, a joint enterprise with health and the Department of Finance's interests in some aspects as well. So we need to agree a timetable for the commencement of the rest of the Act. Um, getting the Dolls provisions in place was something of a priority, uh, and I think we achieved that okay. relatively quickly, given the uh, training that was involved for um, trust staff, which was a, a matter for health, and extending the jurisdiction of the Mental Health Review Tribunal mm -hmm. to take on um, these additional uh, appeals. Okay. It was an extremely large training programme yeah, that no, actually I went in, and we that. had hoped to do it before yeah. Christmas, but it, we were hoping for September, but had to delay it because it was also GPs, it was also care home workers. There's quite a, a family of people have to be trained. Uh, and you see the the, the, the listed uh, what, now you have to be commenced. Uh, is this because uh, of finance or as as a technical because the the power for police officers to take an individual in a place of safety. It, 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 seems, it, it doesn't seem to be a complex piece of, of legislation to, to enact. Well, uh, it's a huge act, so we want to uh, approach it in a sort of strategic way and, and which bits to commence first. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's interlinked, so there might be some pieces which need to be commenced before the, the place of safety yeah. bit can be commenced. Yeah. So we really need to work very closely with health on that. And we have a meeting arranged next month to work out how best we can structure the commencement, but it's, it, it's not a cheap act to commence. No, no, I appreciate that. Um, no, that, that was a big feature of... Yeah. Uh, but, but in terms of... Yeah, I mean, I don't see... I'm, and there's, there's, also, ignorance. there's also a huge amount of subordinate legislation <coughs> which will yeah. be required to support yeah. the primary legislation. But, but it doesn't seem to be, in terms of cost, you know, given the powers to a police officer, they have the power to take someone to a place of safety, it doesn't seem to be... I don't see the cost. I think that is probably linked though to other bits of oh, the okay, Act, okay. which yeah. relate to maybe determining a person's capacity. Yeah. And in terms of the, the, the initiation of a lasting power of attorney, is there any particular reason? Because there's, there's an hour procedure, I think it's a, is it EP and a germ? Yes, attorney? which is yeah. still available. I mean, that's yeah. actually, that, that's not a justice matter. That's a, um, a health and department of finance matter because it is part of this substantive okay. uh, Law, but I think that also would require to be supported by subordinate legislation, and I'm not sure if that could even have been done by negative le legislate or negative mm -hmm. procedure. So, yeah. but, but even the, say like uh, <coughs> part of, of the DOJ to transfer prisoners to to healthcare facilities again. What's the point? Well, that would be a, a major, quite a major thing for major. prisons. I mean, especially if they were to go outside Northern Ireland to yeah. uh, maybe a high security facility in Scotland. Yeah. That needs to be operationalised. We may need legislation in England and Wales and Scotland to be amended, and that would have yeah. to be done by an order in council um, in the UK. Yeah. So, uh, unfortunately, is, it's a lot more complicated than it might appear. So, yeah. we need to work out are there some, I mean, there may be some bits of this Act that could be relatively easily cherry picked yeah. Yeah. and commenced, but it is drafted in a way where it, it is all interlinked. and. Um, it sort of hangs together. Okay, thank you. Gordon Dunn. 
Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much for your <coughs> presentation today. As a new member, I'm very much on the, the learning curve in here, but the cost of legal aid, um, is that is something you can answer on today? Or? That falls to uh, Deborah Brown's uh, area, which is uh, justice delivery. But certainly, if there's an issue, I can. Uh, the only follow. idea of the cost of legal aid, say, last year, 2018, 2019? Uh, off the top of my head, I don't. I, but I, I, I wouldn't like to give that number without um, having the actual facts in front of me, so it's probably better if we. You're content away. if we take that one away for Deborah and her team. Yeah. The other thing, I have the um, review of legal aid report here, 2016. Obviously, there's been a bit of a gap. We haven't been here for a long time. Um, and there certainly were a number of recommendations in that report. But I take it you're, um, you'd be aware of that report and that there would be uh, recommendations, I'm sure, that you've been working on since that. Yes, I mean, there's a lot of new developments in legal aid, the LAM system, the legal aid management system, for example, the payments, which automates it, puts it online. All of those processes have now been put in place and are operationalized. There's other bits that I'm not sure if they have or not been completed. As I say, it's not my area of work, so I, I can't say with any authority whether or not they have been completed or not. There was two issues that was, yeah, were highlighted at that time. Just, just to be fair, Gordon, it is Deborah who dealt yeah, yeah. Deals with this. So. But just to, and just make the points, it was the use of expert witnesses, the controls mm -hmm. that needed to be put on them, and then into, in relation to internal controls and in, that were seen to be in, uh, inadequate to prevent and detect fraud. Uh, there's been an awful lot of work that has been developed in those particular areas, but particularly the fraud area, yeah. in terms to, and part of that is down to the new LAM system which has much clearer reporting and much more search and retrieval of information so that those things can be identified and taken forward. And that has been done in conjunction with the auditors, the non Ireland Audit Office and others being briefed at each step along the way and our own internal auditors as well. So significant progress has been made? Since yes, it has. Right, OK. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. That's it. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Um, just to get back to um, the issue of the Mental Capacity Act, um, my two, like Raymond, sat through it, a good part of it. Um, and I know, Chair, we're going to get a full presentation of glitches within it or good bits within it or things that maybe are unintended consequences of it. I see the Attorney General here, I'm sure he's well aware of those with the, the trusts and the legs. Um, but could, could you tell me just... Um, the, the place of safety, at that time we heard evidence that there were a number of places of safety. Have additional places of safety been added to that? Uh, I know some hospitals did already have those places of safety. Maybe you don't know just off the top of your head today. I, I mean, that sounds but like it would be interesting to hear, following on from that legislation, uh, where those places of safety are, and if in fact, whether it's police or health trusts in particular, have added to those places of safety as a consequence of the introduction of the Mental Capacity Act. Um, the, the other thing is, um, the, the lasting prayer of attorney, to get back to that, um, why is that still not commenced? Um, I would have thought it's not that hugely extensive for the legislation, or is it waiting for one of those is waiting for a minister to take a decision without preempting your. It's not a matter for the Department of Justice. The I'm lasting the part, it's, it's between health. I would mean, as in other, whatever, whether it's justice or health, what's the hold up with it? I'm trying to find out what the hold up with it is. Uh, well, I know, right. I know health have been involved, like us, right. on, on doing the deprivation Sorry, of liberty provisions. That, but and I'm not sure whether, I mean, I, I know there would be regulations yes. required to support that. Um, new lasting parts of attorney provisions, whether they could be done by negative resolution. Yes. Uh, I don't know. I don't honestly know where the other All departments right. are on no, that aspect that. of the Act. Perhaps, perhaps, Chair, that too could be added yeah. to the list whenever we get the, the more yeah. extensive briefing on the Mental Capacity Act. Yeah. That would be helpful. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Is there any, uh, I think, Linda, did you want to Just follow up? two quick, quickly things. Um, the first one, just there is a pilot programme and performance committee is the only one I wasn't on on the policing board so I know that there was a, a visit to it and I'm not 100% sure where it was at 
were in custody suites were held. Yes. And is that part of this? No. Or, or, can, or could it be considered to be that place of safety because you do have the, obviously, that they're in custody, but also mm. that there's a healthcare professional there who is specifically trained to deal with people who have mental health issues? There's a pilot <coughs> for nurse-led custody suites that is running in Musgrave um, going forward. Uh, the introduction of that has proven very successful, with very few people having to be referred on to A and E. But those tend to be for people who are um, a subject of an offence. I'm not sure if those would be designated as a place of safety. My gut would be that a place of safety would be designated by the Department of Health more than by the police. But I, I can't answer. I don't know the detail. No, look, that's fair enough. And just, I suppose, in response to uh, the point that Doug brought up about the homicide officers, the, the PSNA are actually moving forward in relation to legacy cases, just a point of information, using paralegals and researchers because they actually said that that was a gap, that mm. they did not know whenever they're looking through legacy cases how to actually research properly, how to look for what, what it is they actually need to be looking for whenever they're going through all of the the massive um, amounts of, of paperwork. So they've actually said that the, the HAU is going to probably be made up of quite a mix of those mm -hmm. kind of people rather than homicide um, investigators. Obviously, you'll need a, a number of those, but because you're going through past papers, it's more about knowing what you're looking for, and paralegals are probably going to play, play a big part in that. OK. Just, just a, f a couple of questions just to follow up. The, the, the speeding up justice has been, I think, an item in the department from devolution was formed, so mm. obviously it's an ongoing issue and, and probably will continue to be there. <coughs> mm. um, the average time it has taken from 152, is that where we're at at the minute? For provisional information, 153. That's for all cases. Um, so it continued to get worse right through to 2016, is that right? Roughly, if you were to draw the graph, it, it increased. Um, so when we were speeding up justice in 2010, it continued to slow down for six years? Well, there was two legal aid strikes as well that caused backlogs, and then that created issues of its own going forward. There was also an increase in workload throughout that period, up until about 2011. I think there was a downward trend in crime. So what, what's the average in, in GB? I wouldn't have that. I'm not sure if Glyn would have if, that. If, if you can, that, I'll, I'll come back with that detail. Well, what's the main obstacle? It. Obviously, there's something that's incentivising the system to, to, to slow down and do this slowly. Um, I am in this post about a year or so, Chair, um, and having looked at it and having developed um, some of the detailed performance information, um, I think it's very difficult to say what is the the, the big one or two key issues. Like it, w the criminal justice system is a very complex one. When you break it down between Crown Courts, Magistrates Courts and Youth Courts, and then break that down between charge cases and summons cases, and then you take into account the number of stages taking a case through, it's very complex. And I think the, the suite of uh, the speeding of justice program that we have seeks to look at specific issues for specific problems. So it, there's, no, um, there's no magic answer to this. It is looking across the piece at a range of solutions for the specific problems, and we're trying to tackle it on those, those different fronts. Okay. One thing I would say, though, is we won't solve this by legislation, although committal will have a, an impact on it. Most of this will be working at the operational level, sorting out operational issues, so it won't require legislation. And we are doing those reviews and taking that forward as best we can. I'm sure we'll, in due course, look into that finally. Um, the Criminal Law on Child Sexual Exploitation. Mm. 2015, the then committee tabled amendments to David Ford's Justice Bill that would have dealt with these issues. And here we are, 2020, still hasn't released the consultation findings and indicating that It'll need to be further consulted on before bringing four legislation, and it's not included in your list of four legislations to be brought in within the next two years. So, law that we wanted to introduce in 2015, the department still aren't going to be introducing it seven years later. So, I want to find out why there hasn't been action, because the then committee withdrew the amendments on the basis of a commitment by the minister. 
that it would be taken forward by the department. Why is it not been? Why is it? Why is it still not here? Sorry, I don't have that information uh, before me today, but I'm happy to I come back to you on that one. Brands area within your directorate, but there's a miscellaneous provision bill coming. I just say I'll put the department on notice. We'll take the amendments that were due to be tabled in 2015. We'll bring them forward ourselves if the department doesn't bring them forward. And when it comes to the request then to defer that and not to do it, once bitten, twice shy. I think if it's helpful, I think there is work being done um, in Brian's area to scope out what could be inserted into that miscellaneous provisions um, bill. Things like terminology around child prostitution, which is hugely unhelpful, and making sure that that term is not used going forward. So, I'm, you know, I'm sure we can feed back, that back and, and update the committee uh, further on what's happening with that. But you certainly made it plain that it will be a priority and we will have a look at that and take it forward. Thank you very much for coming to the committee. No I appreciate problem. the time and I have no doubt we'll work closely together in the months ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, we'll move move to the the next item on the agenda, um, um, which is the Attorney General. So, I'll invite the Attorney General to come before the committee. Um, so, members, we're, we're going to take, I suppose, two stages. Um, obviously, there's the statutory rules that we want to get some advice from the Attorney on that, that he has laid, uh, and also the broader role of the Attorney General within the criminal justice system. So, we're going to take the latter one first and, and just have a a conversation about the overall role, um, if the Attorney General is agreeable to that, and then we'll move on to specifically deal with the three statutory rules. If you're content, I, I am, Chair. Okay, well, you're very welcome to the meeting. Thank um, you. And uh, with a good, good engagement in the past, um, and I've no doubt that will continue to be the case going forward. Very much so. Uh, I think it was, was during the East Clare um, by-election in 1917, um, Emmond de Valera, uh, which got onto a platform and said, as I was saying when I was interrupted, referring to his uh, arrest some months <laughs> previously. And I have to say, uh, Chair, members of the committee, that uh, if I'd been asked in November, December, um, would I have imagined uh, appearing before the, the committee uh, before the end of January? Uh, I'm afraid I have to be candid and say no, I wouldn't have thought that was at all likely. But it, it's, it's no less delightful uh, that um, the, the Assembly is back up and running, uh, this committee is back up and running. And it's also a particular pleasure for me because uh, um, my arithmetic isn't very good, but there, there are a number of chairs and deputy chairs of this committee, so it's a committee uh, rich in experience and expertise. And as you say, Chair, um, over the years, it's been a very productive working relationship, um, uh, at least certainly from my perspective. And of course, having done this job now for some time, uh, I'm, I'm constantly discovering new things uh, about it, and there are new work streams um, coming along. So, um, reference was made um, to the Mental Capacity Act. 2016, and that's actually had a very significant effect uh, already in the office because I think um, Mr. Blome referred to the, the role, the interface with the trusts. Uh, although this is much more a um, responsibility of health and the health committee, nonetheless, because it deals with uh, liberty uh, and, and rights protected by Article 5, it's something which the committee no doubt will be interested in. Because we now get um, all of the cases in which Form 7 has been filled in, where Form 7 indicates that a person lacks capacity to himself, herself apply to a tribunal, they come to me and I make a determination whether or not their cases should be referred to the tribunal or not. Um, I have looked at some today. Uh, in the month of January alone, we have more than 100 um, cases, so what you, you can imagine the extent of the uh, workload coming from that new stream alone. Um, can I let Patsy just? I, I know you've yes. given a brief, uh, a broad overview. Uh, probably wrong of me to interrupt, but just know Patsy wanted to follow up on that before no, you move I, I, off. I'd be very glad to have. Okay, so I, absolutely. I know you've done work, and, and people appreciate the work that you've done in a sympathetic role, but it seems to be 
that the role of a, where a person is incapacitated goes to a tribunal and they may well be for their court proceedings consequent to that and the person is so utterly incapacitated that they are unable to attend that uh, and I know it may have been the unintended consequences of the legislation that that would be the outworkings of it but can you give us some sort of insights as to the real practical difficulties that that is causing? Well, time will tell. I mean, it's only been commenced mm -hmm. at the start of December. Um, and already, for example, uh, some of the cases, and this is inevitable when one is dealing with very frail, elderly people, mm -hmm. uh, some cases have been referred. The, the patient has, in fact, died yes. before a tribunal could mm -hmm. be convened. The, the, the legislation is itself a response to a decision of the UK Supreme Court, Cheshire West, mm -hmm. which took, uh, I think it's safe to say, a fairly expansive view of the requirements of Article 5 of the Convention. So uh, Baroness Hale famously said, a gilded cage is still a cage. So even though uh, someone is deprived of their liberty for the, the, the best of motives, uh, nonetheless, Article 5 is engaged and the Article 5 safeguard should exist. So that requires ultimately the possibility of judicial determination mm. of the legality of that detention. Yes. And um, hence, even though, as you rightly say, a person who is not capacitous will have great difficulty, in fact it may not be in the realm of um, reality at all mm -hmm. for them to present a case, nonetheless it should be looked at in certain cases by a tribunal. Yeah. Let me give you a, a relatively concrete example, okay. not referring to any mm -hmm. specific case. So if someone uh, manifests an unhappiness with the detention, if someone uh, expresses a wish to go home, however fanciful that wish may be in reality, they have objected to the mm -hmm. detention and therefore the objection should at least be sufficiently respected so that it's assessed, mm -hmm. the proportionality of the detention is judicially assessed by the tribunal. But does this have massive resource implications for the tribunal, uh, for me? Yes, it does. The, the, the bit that's been acknowledged, of course, is the resource implications for the trust and the individual care and nursing homes. Mm -hmm. But um, th there will be, and it's again, this is where it brings it very centrally into the purview of this committee, it will have an impact on the, the justice system more generally. And Mr. Graham, the Labour this chair. <coughs> In the instance where the tribunal has ruled, and even if, if that person has moved in a phased manner from being debilitated and maybe compus mentis ish to the point where they simply aren't compus mentis, but the consequence of the tribunal ruling is for a court hearing or an appearance or something like that, how, 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 practically how would that work? No, so there would be no question of. Uh, someone um, labouring under disabilities of that kind being, as it were, dragged before right. the tribunal. There would be no question of that, indeed. Uh -huh. In the uh, tribunal decisions that have taken place thus far, there have been decisions on the papers. All right, OK. So, um, I mean, the tribunal is, of course, itself acutely aware of this. Mm -hmm. I don't speak for the tribunal, but the tribunal, uh, I think one can safely conclude, is fully aware of that issue and has, to my knowledge thus far, treated the matter very sensitively, hence with paper okay. decisions. Right. Okay, thanks very much for that. Thanks, Chair. Uh, uh, probably let, let me get, allow you to get back to, to giving your kind of overview of your role, but, um, and hopefully this question will help. In, in intervening in these cases, on, on what authority do you have the power to decide there's an interest here, a public interest that I as Attorney General can get involved in, because it isn't just when it comes to these issues, you've intervened on a range of issues, um, uh, very broad in nature, from Brexit um, to, to, to other cases. So does that take us into your broader remit as the guardian of the rule of law? And I would well, be just curious to explore that. Yeah, well, it, 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 it's, a, it's a, if I may say so, Richard, it's a great question. In fact, the, the, uh, the work under the Mental Capacity Act is a very specific, discrete, new set of statutory responsibilities. So um, someone is detained, the, the, at least in, in terms of what's been commenced thus far, under Schedule 1 or Schedule 2 uh, of the Mental Capacity Act, depending on whether it's a, a, a six-month or a short-term authorisation. And my power comes under Section 47 um, of that Act. But the issue you raise is important because, obviously, one of the traditional rules uh, of um, the Attorney General of this jurisdiction and historically the Attorney General uh, for Ireland uh, before uh, 1922 was guardian of the rule of law. And um, that means that 
I look after um, the public interest in civil proceedings. We, we've given a bit, a certain amount of um, concreteness to that uh, in all of the uh, jurisdictions, devolved jurisdictions of the UK. So the Lord Advocate in uh, Scotland, Council General uh, in Wales, and I here can uh, intervene in devolution issues. In our context, that's defined by paragraph 1 of Schedule 10 to the Northern Ireland Act. But even apart from that, one can intervene in cases where um, it is felt that the public interest uh, ought to be represented. And that ranges from things where, for example, uh, I intervened uh, at the request of a court very recently in a case involving a very recondite point of company law um, just last month. Um, and I've also intervened in the cases, again, which will be uh, familiar with the committee. And the post in origin is a very old one. It, it's now got a statutory overlay in the 2002 Act, and obviously there's an aspect of that which I know the committee will want to discuss. That's the issue of superintendents. And, you know, it, it's, it's part of the common law stroke um, constitutional tradition of these islands that often rules are not over-defined, um, and this rule is, is, is very much one of them. And if I can concretise that a bit, the, the engagement that I had this morning, I hosted a colloquium on illegal money lending, um, and that had a number of interfaces. I, I take the view that illegal money lending is uh, a scourge um, in many communities in Northern Ireland. It's uh, sometimes used by certain paramilitary groups as a means of uh, enhancing their control in certain communities. Um, and they do so largely with impunity. So we had people from um, the relevant um, English um, anti-loan sharking uh, teams, Department of Justice, uh, PPS, PSNI, Consumer Council, who have done incredible research um, in this area, to see if there are creative ways in which we can engage with that. Because, um, yes, there is a, a formal criminal law illegality. Uh, illegal money laundering is obviously uh, an offence. But if you have a situation where there's a running, festering sore, um, it's, I see it as, as, as part of my role to try to think of creative ways in which that problem can be addressed. Um, and, and certainly the, the session this morning was a very successful one. And in terms of ways in which I've interpreted the role that others may not, um, I think that there is a, an issue in this jurisdiction with um, the law um, and the legal profession seeming very other um, to large sections of our population, not actually in terms of um, any uh, religious or ethnic breakdown, but simply in terms of, of class and economics. You know, one can think of certain schools um, in the Greater Belfast area where you, know, you, you couldn't walk down a corridor without bumping into the son or daughter of a lawyer. And there are other schools where, where that is simply an impossibility. And I take the view, therefore, and I've enhanced starting to programme uh, living law aimed only at the non-grammar secondary uh, sector to uh, encourage interest in law as a subject to be studied at university or to be thought of as a possible profession, uh, and even those who don't wish to contemplate either of those possibilities, to realise that the law is theirs, um, and we have another programme called It's Your Law, mm -hmm. and the idea of that is, I think, completely encapsulated in the title, that the law is the common birthright of all citizens. Um, you know, without respect of um, class uh, or creed, emphasis particularly on class, because I think that's the um, perhaps the dominant issue um, in this jurisdiction. Um, and, and if I can just take yeah. you, you mentioned it to the superintendents yeah. issue, and this is I just wanted to ask about the role of the Attorney General in Northern Ireland being held as an unelected position in comparison to uh, other jurisdictions, um, and. So there's an issue about accountability um, to the democratic institutions, and also, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, 
excuse me, um, the governance arrangements for the Public Prosecution Service. The Attorney General, the Office of the Attorney General, appoints the Director of the Public Prosecution Service, uh, who is then um, independent in terms of prosecutorial decision making. Um, if you can just explain uh, what the difference is in Northern Ireland when it comes to superintendent's arrangements for the PPS and accountability arrangements for the Attorney General in other parts of the United Kingdom? Well, the, the, the biggest contrast is probably um, between, even in this jurisdiction, between 2002 or the commencement of the relevant parts of the 2002 Act, um, before and after. So uh, before the, the relevant parts of the 2002 Act were commenced, the uh, Attorney General for England and Wales was also uh, Attorney General for Northern Ireland. And uh, so long as that um, persisted, uh, she or he um, had superintendents of the Public Prosecution Service. And it, it struck me as um, perhaps paradoxical that, that at the moment when you removed the uh, party political uh, component, that is, uh, that the Attorney General for Northern Ireland ceased to be a, um, an English MP, essentially, or an English peer, in the case of Baron of Scotland, that um, the superintendents went, notwithstanding that the uh, new attorney, uh, unlike um, the director, <coughs> had provision for direct interface um, with the Assembly, for example, uh, by participation in Assembly proceedings, obviously not voting, principally one imagines through the answering of uh, assembly questions. And at the present time, I suppose Scotland is the most useful um, comparator. The Scottish Lord Advocate is considered uh, one of the Scottish ministers, so he is a political appointment to that extent. But the relevant devolution statute in Scotland makes clear that the Lord Advocate is independent in his prosecutorial functions and in relation to his investigation of death functions. So he stands at the very apex mm -hmm. um, of the prosecution system uh, in Scotland, which differs, uh, admittedly, from our own in certain respects. But nonetheless, um, he is independent utterly as to that, while uh, forming part, for other purposes, of the collective of Scottish ministers. And actually, it's just interesting because it's, it's um, whenever. Um, Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Finlay held the ranks the PSNI that they did. Both of them, of course, uh, had significant Scottish experience. Uh, one indeed um, is Scottish. And one of the issues which I informally discussed with them was their familiarity with the role of the Procurator Fiscal Service, again, ultimately subject to the Lord Advocate, who would uh, superintend um, police investigations. And obviously, Police, given their autonomy and expertise, would be left to investigate properly. But if there was something that occurred to the, the PF service, d directions could be given. Um, and it was a very useful way in which the um, justice and independence um, could be very effectively secured. So um, my experience, and I've said this several times in, in successive annual reports, is that we, we should... Um, perhaps ratchet back uh, and, and have some uh, relationship of superintendents. Obviously, even when superintendents existed, the 99.9% .9 of decisions uh, by the director would be utterly unaffected by any input from the attorney of the day, but there was the capacity for uh, doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, with that, I think, came the capacity for um, greater accountability. Now, it, it's, it's never right, um, I think, for um, a prosecutorial decision to be taken on the basis of, of public clamour. Um, you know. But at the same time, uh, I think there's um, huge responsibility um, to make prosecutorial decisions uh, of whatever kind as accountable as possible. Mm -hmm. um, the issue is not... Um, the legislature bending the director of the prosecution service to its will. It's so that there is a relationship of mutual understanding um, between the uh, two bodies with respect to their respective functions. So, and, and controversial decisions whether to prosecute or not 
uh, as it currently stands, the Director of the Public Prosecution Service in Northern Ireland can take that decision and there is no recourse, one, to the Attorney General's office. The Attorney General cannot um, interfere in that, seek information about that. Uh, it has no role whatsoever, just for clarity. Uh, and, and then, <coughs> two, uh, unlike in other jurisdictions, the democratic deficit that exists that we then can't ask ourselves, the Director of the Public Prosecution Service, via the Attorney General, because the Attorney General's office has no role over the Public Prosecution Service. And, and therein lies the problem that uh, parliamentarians in, in Westminster and Scotland can raise these issues in the very rare occasion that it would ever happen. And there is a system of accountability there which we don't have here. And so how do we square that circle, uh, given that the post holder for the AG uh, is, is and will continue to be an unelected uh, member? And therefore, when we want to ask questions, statements, and it will take us on to the statutory rules, if we decided to pray against one of your statutory rules, seek to uh, vote that down in the Assembly, who speaks on your behalf? Well, that, that, that's absolutely right, um, Chair. Um, no one, um, and, um, and, and thereby lies a problem. Of course, in a way, uh, and before I, I deal with the larger issue, that actually it shows how one can make a virtue out of necessity, because that very fact has been one of the prompts towards a particularly historic, um, fruitful relationship. Um, between the committee uh, and myself in relation to, I have to ensure that the committee um, get what we're trying to do in relation to the guidance, and as far as possible, uh, be uh, relatively on board at least uh, with the direction of travel. But uh, you're right. Um, the Scotland is perhaps the best example. The, the position in um, England and Wales is probably closer to ours, with the exception of national security cases, which give rise to uh, different considerations. But in Scotland, there is a regular slot for questions to the Lord Advocate, and he simply he turns up in um, the Scottish Parliament and he, he answers questions. Um, and sometimes they've been about quite significant issues. There was the sort of the, the, the dreadful case of the, the refuse lorry uh, um, sort of losing control apparently uh, and you know several people being killed as a result and the controversy about that and that was a matter which obviously uh, would have been uh, the source of many questions I think to the Lord Advocate at the time. Well the, the, the remedy is um, simply in the hands of the committee and the assembly as a whole if the committee takes a view on this, the uh, committee can legislate. Um, and there is no, I mean, historically, for example, we um, have, have less experience because we haven't had a, a local attorney since 1972. But that local attorney, um, Sir Basil Kelly, um, as, as he later was, Lord Justice Kelly, um, was a unionist MP. He, 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 he stalked these corridors. Um, and, and yet, um, the hope is that uh, when he was dealing with prosecutorial matters, he wasn't acting. Uh, there will, of course, be the usual uh, controversy about this, but you know, the, the constitutional principle was that he wasn't acting as a party politician. Um, and I, I would regard it as um, a statement of great political health of this place if there was no bar to the Attorney General of the day being an MLA. Um, that would be um, something that <coughs> one might be proud of, um, that the community would have confidence that someone could be a politician, whether from the, the Green Party, the Ulster Unionist Party, Sinn Féin or Alliance, whoever, uh, but would nonetheless uh, discharge the core functions of the office uh, in a way which was palpably independent. But short of that, and that's probably somewhat utopian. Yeah. There's no reason why one couldn't uh, tweak so that the pre-2002 position uh, yeah, the applied right. to the attorney, statutorily independent, with the provision for um, questions uh, in the Assembly, and for that measure of accountability from him or her to the Assembly. That, that, would, that would necessitate the Attorney-General's office having 
some form of superintendence of the PPS. Yes. Otherwise, you're yes. being held to account for things that you have That's absolutely right. no absolutely. locus over. That's right. Uh, so it's it's two issues. It's it's the accountability of the AG and the AG's yes. ability to superintend. That's right. While still respecting the kind of uh, decision making process that the PPS would 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 have to go through and, and what level of superintendence you would seek to have. That's right. Okay. Just finally, then, and that'll be me finished. Um, in terms of the the uh, UK's withdrawal arrangements and the role of the European courts in Northern Ireland. Can you provide some clarity as to <laughs> what, 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 what is going to be the role uh, of the I European agree. Court of <laughs> Justice <laughs> and the European Court of Human uh, Rights for well, Northern Ireland? The, the, the first thing, of course, is that the, and the, the, the only easy part of that question, Chair, is the, the reference to the European Court of Human Rights, because the European Court of Human Rights um, is a Council of Europe um, uh, court and therefore, the, the UK is still a signatory to the European Convention on Human Rights, um, and the Human Rights Act is still in force. So the uh, European Court of Human Rights will continue um, to be significant uh, and will be the, the ultimate interpreter uh, of the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, the, the other issues, the, the, the issue of the continued uh, relevance of the Luxembourg Court in relation to the, the protocol uh, well, that's very much a, a work in progress. And the one thing I will say is that the, um, the European Union in its present form is to a very large extent the creation of uh, the judicial interpretation um, by the court of relevant treaty provisions from time to time. So, for example, the doctrine of the supremacy of EU law is something which you still don't find um, embodied in treaty text. Uh, it's a creation uh, in its origin um, of the Luxembourg Court. And uh, Just the coda to that is that it's now acknowledged as nonetheless a principle of EU law uh, in one of the annexes to the, the, the last um, treaty. Okay, members. Can I just ask a question on, on superintendents? Of course. Uh, in, in relation to in our jurisdiction's relationship between the attorney and the the prosecution service is there is there grounds on which the attorney has to satisfy before he can maybe ask for a review of a, a case or can he do it in any grounds? Well, it, it varies from case to case. Obviously, in a number of North American jurisdictions, um, the the attorney has attorney general has a limited role. In Scotland, it's um, it would be the judgment by the Lord Advocate as to whether or not he should intervene in what is a, essentially a, a hierarchical mm -hmm. position anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so he, he is ultimately accountable uh, for prosecutions um, and he will decide whether or not something merits some issue, merits his particular attention. Mm -hmm. But that's actually reinforced then by the, the extent to which it becomes a matter of public interest through interventions by NSP saying, well, what are you doing about this? Yeah. Well, if someone asks, what are you doing about this? It's usually a very good way of getting someone to at least look at the issue yeah. if she or he hasn't done so before. But it does it, open up the sort of situation when they nearly become, you know, if, you, if a person doesn't get satisfaction with PPS, that that becomes nearly the a complaints department without, you know... Yeah. Well, sometimes that happens already, um, uh, uh, where it's particularly useless, where yeah. you, you almost sort of have to write back and I, can't do, I can't do anything. Okay. Um, but um, I think it's, it's good often to have a second pair of eyes. Yeah. Um, and if it's... It, I mean, I was able to see, during the period uh, immediately prior to being appointed, uh, I could see a bit of the relationship between the um, the English Attorney's Office and um, what Sir Alistair Fraser, uh, who was then the director, did. And it was um, usually on the basis of weekly meetings, uh, and it was a very light touch. And as I say, um, I'm, I'm not aware personally of any decision that was altered uh, or adjusted as a result of that kind of superintendence. And in that relationship, would it be that if the, the prosecution service felt that Trump might be in very commas controversial or needs particular gains, they would, they, 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 would they have the power to go to the attorney? Yes, they would. Yeah. Yes, they would. Okay. Yeah. And indeed, there's a sense in which um, there's also the way in which a, um, an issue, the burden of an issue, can be shared. Yeah.
Is there not a case Baroness Scotland directed a prosecution to take place in Northern Ireland? Uh, you, you, you may be right, but 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 if I it, but, but if you are, I I, I, I can't I can't recall. It was a murder I, of yeah. a young uh, a young individual, and I think the Baroness Scotland directed a prosecution yeah. to take place after Review. after yeah. Uh, well, when the PPS didn't proceed. I I wonder though uh, if, if uh, because we may be speaking at cross purposes. If this wasn't a case where um, a very um, energetic parent yeah. uh, continued and wouldn't take no for an answer, and, and rightly in the event because there was a successful prosecution, I'm not sure if, if that was um, as a result of a direction by the then attorney, but simply I think if we're speaking in the same case, it was one where um, the advice of independent counsel was obtained and on the basis of that, uh, the decision was reversed. Because it, it, it's, it's, it's important to bear in mind that the, um, the director, um, not merely now, but has always been open to looking again mm -hmm. at cases. Okay. Okay, members, if you're happy, we'll move on to the statutory rules. Um, sorry, sorry Chair, Rachel, um, yes. Oh, just, um, thank you very much for coming. This is the um, first time meeting, um, and I appreciate you coming this afternoon to outline your position. Um, just on the back of recent appointments that the committee has been, in the pack been aware of, of six temporary High Court judges last week, um, and congratulate them obviously on their appointments. Um, can I just confirm um, that you are to be appointed as Deputy High Court Judge tomorrow? Well, um, I, I don't carry out a function uh, on behalf of NIJAC or the Office of the Lord Chief Justice. Um, and it's, it's probably better um, if I don't answer your question um, in the way in which you put it, because there are certain protocols uh, about uh, announcements to full or part-time uh, judicial positions. But c can I suggest that um, you might want to maybe ask a question on the basis of a, of a hypothetical? Okay, so hypothetically, in the interests of openness, transparency and public confidence in the system, would there be any hypothetical insurances that you could give hypothetically to the committee regarding any potential hypothetical conflicts of interest in a tenure as Attorney General um, if it's expiring later this year? Um, excellent question. Um, well, I, I, I think the, the hypothetical hypothetically, um, hypothetically um, the starting point would be that um, cases, as I understand, uh, that are to be assigned to um, the temporary part-time High Court judges um, are, of course, in, in a sense, um, allocated only if there is a judgment by the person making the allocation that the uh, temporary um, High Court judge will be able to do the case. Um, and there is a fairly rich body of law uh, on the uh, appearance of bias, uh, and on actual bias, um, and uh, all judges, indeed all lawyers, are pretty well aware of the content of that law. So, for example, um, if um, temporary lawyer A had advised um, in a matter that was central to the issue coming before him or her, the judge wouldn't sit in, in such a case. Um, and it really is as, as straightforward um, as that. Um, now, I should say that um, temporary part-time judges are very frequently used in England and Wales. It is, of course, a larger jurisdiction. And that might have certain advantages uh, in terms of that. Um, but I think, for what it's worth, that the Lord Chief Justice is to be commended for undertaking this experiment, um, because I think one of the things that um, government, uh, both capital G and small g government, needs to do is to acknowledge that so many of the things that we do are in the nature of experiments, um, and sometimes the, best, the very best experiments aren't those that um, work. Uh, the very best experiments are the ones that sometimes don't work so well, and it's from them that you learn most. So, short answer, um, uh, any um,
temporary uh, or for that matter full-time judge is aware of a fairly firm body of existing um, decided case law on issues such as conflict uh, apparent or actual bias and uh, should be expected to comport himself herself accordingly hypothetically of course grateful for the addition yeah. okay members yeah. I, I, I hate asking a question in case my ignorance is exposed uh, <laughs> was there a particular reason given for these appointments I, I noted this, the statement around the six individuals last week um, yeah. to deal with the, the volume of caseload that is there. Across, um, across the piece? Or I'm not sure why we haven't yeah, been able yeah, to, okay. to, or NIJAC yeah. hasn't been able to appoint f permanent, full time High Court judges mm. um, as to why it's been necessary to, to go down this route. Yeah. Um, I certainly was interested when I read it myself, and I, I did think myself, you know, how, how will those. Barristers manage their role as a High Court judge one day and then making representation to their colleagues, in effect, the next day in a different capacity? Uh, um, well, I, I agree. Um, and it, it, it's, um, it, it will not be without its um, interest um, in, in terms of how those issues are. Um, successfully managed. It's interesting that the, the issue, I think, uh, was floated um, in Dublin, um, but was thought not to be um, a runner. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, this, we've had NIJAC, well, the Lord Chief Justice, I think, is still the chairman of NIJAC. He is. Yeah. So the committee has in the past engaged with yeah. the Lord Chief Justice in his role as chairman of NIJAC, and I've no doubt you know, when it comes to the appoint judicial appointments, it's something we'll pick up again in the future. Yeah. Linda, you, you're it's content? Okay. 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 <coughs> well, in, in, in terms of the first statutory rule uh, is in respect of domestic abuse and stalking order, members, it's on page 228 to 56 of the, the meeting pack. Um, the, the examiner of statutory rules will report our findings on the uh, technical elements of the, the, this rule and the, the other two rules that are being considered today in the near future. Normally, we would have been able to consider uh, we would have considered the statutory rule once we had received the examiner's report. However, members know the reasons as to why that's not the case. Um, the Attorney General is required under Section 8 one of the Justice Northern Ireland Act 2004 to issue guidance to named criminal justice organisations on the exercise of their functions in a manner that's consistent with international human rights standards and uh, the rule 2018-108 uh, will bring into operation the Attorney General's human rights guidance in respect of domestic abuse stalking for the police, public prosecution service, probation board, Northern Ireland courts and tribunal services and the rule is subject to negative resolution. So, John, I'll hand over to you if you just want to give a, an overview of the... Well, yes. um, first thing is, uh, and it applies to, to all of um, these uh, pieces of guidance, is that none of them change the law, save to the extent that they require new things to be taken into account. Um, and that's very important because I'm, I'm aware, as, as are we all, of um, discussion about legislative change in relation to domestic abuse and stalking. And um, you will see um, from the text of the guidance itself that in many ways, yes, of course, the, the, the commencement order is the, 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 the bit that's placed before you, but obviously you, you need to look at the, the, the guidance, the meat uh, of it is... Um, what really uh, matters. And one of the things which um, I'm keen to get across in this guidance is that this is a problem. We know it exists. We know it's a scourge. But we need to know more about how the, the police principally respond to it. Uh, and therefore, um, we want the police to um, deal with, um, tell us why that they are um, not taking action in a particular case. So for example, if one looks at the section recording and analysis beginning at paragraph 37, 
So, for every reported uh, incident of domestic abuse and stalking, a record must be kept, um, and then at a minimum, um, and then um, an analysis at forty um, of serious crime cases and of decisions not to arrest should be carried out on a regular basis by a senior PSNI officer. And in many ways, that's, that's a very short paragraph, uh, but in many ways, is one of the most important. Um, if acted upon in bringing about effective change here, because this is one of the issues. Uh, I, I don't say this is a criticism. There may be all kinds of very good reasons for police inaction in particular cases, but let's know what they are. And I remember um, this is the product of a consultation with Women's Aid um, and uh, anti-stalking groups, and I remember attending a, a meeting one Friday afternoon, and it had been my plan to simply uh, look in briefly uh, to a meeting which was being uh, run by a senior member of staff. But it, it was um, an intensely chilling experience because um, three women um, re recounted their experience of uh, stalking and domestic abuse, more characterised as, as the, the, the abuse of stalking rather than in, in the standard um, extant domestic setting. But what struck me was the, there is a, out there uh, an existence of uh, abuse of largely uh, male partners or ex-partners whose malevolence is matched only by their energetic commitment to acting uh, on their malevolence. The, the sheer ingenuity and persistence um, displayed in trying to make the lives of these women miserable it was astonishing. I mean, it, it, in a sense, one, one can read such things, uh, and obviously, intellectually, one absorbs such things. But the, 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 there was something truly chilling in being exposed to these testimonies in terms of simply how creative, inventive, and committed these men were um, to doing harm to former partners. So um, it's about changing a culture. Uh, doesn't change the law, save to the very limited extent that I've mentioned it. Um, but if acted upon, um, I think it will help to change that culture. Okay, Linda. Um, I think that this goes to something that I said earlier on, and I noticed that Paul, the previous chair, actually obviously had some experience with this as well. That I was concerned that the PSNA are not even using. You know, we're, we're talking about bringing in new legislation. And, and the length of time it will take to train PSNI officers and understand how to use that. And I'm concerned that they don't even use the powers which they already have. And I wondered, is it that they don't fully understand or they don't get the adequate training? And that, if, if that's the case, that's an issue for our new members on the policing board who've taken over from me. Um, but, or, or is it the case that, that they are just not using those powers? And, and if that's the case, then we need to, we need to ensure. I suppose it's not for me to put you in the spot and ask which you think it is, but, but I have concerns that, that there's a bit of both. Put me in the spot right, right away, um, uh, Ms. Dillon. You know, you know. I, would I would like your, yeah. your view of it. You know, is it the case that the PSNA are not using the powers, that it's, it's too much like hard work, there's a lot of follow-up on it, and, and it is hard work. It is hard work to tie these people down, because you're right. The, the only other thing I would say that matches their malevolence and their ability to act on it is the, the deviousness and yeah. how far they can go yeah. to really pull the wall over people's eyes you know, and convince people that they are almost the victim yeah. in all of this. So um, is it the case that the PSNA are, are choosing not to act or that, or that they're not fully aware, they don't fully understand what their powers are? Well, um, let me... Uh, and I apologise, but this isn't a direct answer to your question. But this guidance is designed to ensure that there would be no excuse for not fully using the powers that they presently have. And I have to say, um, I entirely agree with the general proposition. In one sense, it's no point introducing um, you know, a new piece of legislation uh, if really what is required, for some things at least, is a full utilisation of existing legislation. 
Um, and I, I think that's usually it's different. Obviously, if you're saying that which is not an offence previously, if you make it an offence, well, that's a, that's a clear change. But if you're not enforcing the, the law in relation to conduct which everyone acknowledges is criminal already, then that's something which you, you need to have a, a look at. Can I simply sort of, you know, sort of round out this by saying that the deviousness I should have mentioned because it's, it's part and parcel of this uh, and it manifests itself in, oh, I was just walking down the street. Uh, it's a free country. Why can't I walk down here? And the difficulty, of course, is, uh, and one has to acknowledge this, from a, an enforcement perspective, unless an order is in place, the, the, for someone who is at the end of their tether um, by reason of a history of stalking, that the impact of simply seeing someone walk past the head and shoulders above the hedge um, can be genuinely terrifying. And yet, absent an order that has been breached, no offence has been committed. But what I want to do is then say, well, if no arrest, and the answer is because it wasn't, no offence was committed, but then it starts building a piece of the jigsaw, um, and then it becomes part of the campaign of harassment. So, um, very much hope this will change uh, our operational culture, improve our operational culture, um, and let's see how it works. Okay. Yep. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at that point for the, an analysis of uh, serious crime cases, and yes, the, the domestic abuse and stalking is an awful thing, but I'm, I'm trying to find out could similar good practice, which it should be, is that done within the PS, and I am thinking of other cases too, where there may be blackmail, there may be intimidation, maybe extortion, of a similar ilk, a similar type of, of uh, behaviour by individuals. But in general, I'm wondering, is there a process whereby the police do this regularly, of all serious crime, which I would be expecting they should do? Yeah. Well, uh, th there was a little, uh, I wouldn't say pushback on this, um, but uh, the, the, in a way, what one is looking for, the decisions not to arrest. So take, for example, the, 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 the person who claims that they're simply innocently uh, strolling down the street. Um, uh, we, we know that it's not for an innocent purpose, but on the face of things, no crime has been committed. Um, there wouldn't be any um, analysis of that as a problem. It might be an entry in a notebook, mm -hmm. um, you know, complaint that so and so was standing outside the house, uh, turned up not there, um, no action. But there, there, there wouldn't be the, the fuller analysis that paragraph 40 um, yes. would call for. Um, but you're right in, in a sense that in relation to a range of serious offences, um, there's no reason why one wouldn't want to do that in other cases as well. I suppose the point here is, it's a bit like the debate about something like Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. one, 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 there is a campaign about Black Lives Mattering because there is an issue uh, about law enforcement in the United States. Um, that's not to say that you know, white lives don't matter. Um, so that I'm doing this in the context of domestic abuse and stalking doesn't mean that it shouldn't happen elsewhere. But there is a problem here, and mm. that's what paragraph 40 is designed yep. to address. I'm getting that, but implicit in that is it's not done elsewhere too. Well, that's, um, that's what I'm reading from. But, then, that. but if, as I very much hope, um, the implementation and acting on paragraph 40 leads to um, improvement in this area, mm -hmm. then uh, just because of I'm not saying it. it doesn't mean that the police oh, can't do it, so I, I very much hope that they would then um, use this at yeah. their discretion and judgment to build on their own uh, best practice. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. All three. Thank you, Chair. Yep, I, I have an issue with this, as Linda rightly uh, alludes to. I'll give you an example. Uh, when I brought in the Child Protection Disclosure Scheme, uh, and I tried to convince the police and others that this was the right idea and it's right that I would put an amendment into uh, legislation into one of the justice bills. They were totally opposed to it and tried to talk me out of it and it was all about process. It was all about what process that would take, how could they cope. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about cause and effect, it was about their process. And can I say that the PS and I have totally failed on the promotion of the Child Protection Disclosure Scheme for whatever reason, I do not know. I think it's process. Uh, 
Uh, now, gladly, having spoken to the people at the top who matter, there is going to be a relaunch of that. Uh, but why I give you that example, Chair, is simply because I don't trust the police to actually fulfil what is law at the present time. So, whilst I think this is a, a, a novel pursuit and one that is very worthy and, of course, human rights based, uh, John, can I ask, first of all, the need and the necessity to do this? Obviously, you have sought this as a seen this as a massive problem and sought to change. Yeah. And how effective could this be, this guidance be, albeit going through a legal procedure, without having in place legislation or a bill going through this place on domestic violence? Well, it's an enormous question because Again, as Ms. Dillon said, you know, it's, it's no point um, having legislation um, where the, the problem, at least in part, in large measure, is the failure to properly use the legislation that we have. Um, and, and sometimes, and I'm speaking in the abstract here, sometimes uh, new legislation can be used as a bit of an alibi uh, by an organisation for not properly using the legislation that is probably pretty adequate, um, sufficiently adequate for the, for the job in hand. So um, there is a provision for review and monitoring uh, in this, and obviously that's something which uh, we will continue to um, explore. And I, if I can, who actually monitors it? Is it your office yes. or is it the police? Yes. Well, the police, and the, the, the police are invited to bring to us problems with the um, implementation of this. Yes. Um, and um, I'll be corrected, I'm sure, if I'm wrong. They haven't done that. So we will then be inviting them to um, actually tell us how it's working in practice. Uh, but also, although that's the, 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 the formal interface, the, I emphasise the formal interface, is with the relevant criminal justice body. There is nothing to stop um, women's aid, individual women, other citizens from actually getting to saying, well, actually, I've seen your guidance, and in fact, in my uh, area, this isn't happening, and they're not doing this. And I'd very much um, welcome that kind of input. It's quite detailed. So, paragraph 37, recording and analysis. So, for every reported incident of domestic abuse and stalking, a record must be kept by PSNI at a minimum. The following must be recorded, and you list out yeah. eight yeah. items, which is quite detailed. Yeah. Uh, again, process for the police, yeah. uh, which will horrify them. But so, surely that's you are actually changing the mindset and the psyche and the operational sense of the PSNI even before the introduction of legislation uh, or change of legislation or a new creation of legislation. Do you think, in your mind, that it should take a year then, uh, after royal assent, for a domestic uh, violence bill, once it receives royal assent, do you think it should take a year then to roll out into operational? Uh, well, operation? I'm going to give the classic lawyer's answer. Um, that depends. Uh, so it depends what's in it. I haven't seen it. Um, and the big advantage about this, from a police perspective, is that they, they don't. If, for example, they don't comply with its terms, they are not breaking the law. Uh, if they take a decision at the outset, oh, we're not having regard to this, mm -hmm. they would break the law. Um, and therefore, the, the the bill that's been discussed um, will be quite different. It will impose obligations, um, which will result in a, in a breach of the law if they are not. Um, faithfully uh, implemented, uh, and therefore we will need to see the text of that. But again, um, the, the advantage, I suppose, that I have in a small office is that usually um, we can make things happen quickly, mm -hmm. it, sometimes not as quickly as we like, but usually in relative terms quite quickly. And, and therefore, my view, um, the old-fashioned view sometimes, is where there's a will, there's a way. OK, thank you. Thank okay. you. OK, members. Just one comment. It's good to meet you, John, and uh, thank you for your input today. Um, 
The police would always make the point in, in relation to domestic violence. It's a huge issue for them. They would say locally it's one of the biggest problems they have. And there are all different levels of it. And um, I noticed here in paragraph 40 talk about regular basis. I'm sure you thought long and hard about that regular basis. You know, would that be, would that be a month or could that be three months? Well, tying in with, with what I said um, to, to Mr. Frew, the, the, um, I don't want... I want to encourage uh, a culture of uh, sensitivity to the issue and a culture of efficiency. I don't want to be prescriptive. I'm not part of the police command structure. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I want them to look at that uh, and I want them to make a judgment about what they think that means um, right. and yeah. to actually uh, to work with the green of the guidance to produce a result. Um, you know, uh, if they come and say, look, we're doing this on a, a six-monthly basis, I'd say, well, how is that working for you? Um, um, is that yielding the results that you hoped it would? I suppose it depends on the scale of the, it does. Of the whole case, really. It does. it does, very much so. Yeah, right, thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. Okay, members, if members are content, I'll put the question now formally to the committee that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2018 forward slash 108 the Attorney General's Human Rights Guidance, Domestic Abuse and Stalking Order, Northern Ireland, 2018, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, the next uh, statutory rule then to consider, uh, you'll find it on pages 58 to 80 uh, of your uh, meeting pack. Uh, again, the rule subject to negative resolution, and uh, it relates to Human Rights Guidance, uh, 1967. Uh, to rape victims and those to whom they make disclosures in connection with the claim for social security, child tax, cre child tax credit or anonymous registration on the electoral uh, order. So, John, again, I'll invite you just to give us a brief overview. Well, in terms of, there is a work in progress um, over and above this because uh, assiduous readers of Sir John Gillan's report We'll see that, that he has um, referred to this and has expressed the view that um, I should issue guidance more widely in relation to, to Section 5, uh, so that people who make disclosures generally in relation to social workers, um, medical personnel, uh, other trusted professionals, with whom there can be expected to be a reasonable relationship of confidence, don't then um, cause a problem uh, for that um, person, the disclosee, uh, in relation to Section 5. We are the only jurisdiction in the UK which has um, the equivalent of Section 5. It is a <coughs> codification of the common law offence of misprison of felony. And um, members with a, a little leisure uh, may want to read the debates uh, in the House of Commons uh, on that. And there's a very useful contribution by um, Sir Robert Porter, as he uh, later became, uh, on that. And it, it may have been, this provision may have been slightly overinterpreted, um, and it can give rise to problems, but properly analysed, it ought not to. So this arose as part of a concrete problem rising through the introduction of universal credit. Uh, as you know, there is the uh, two-child cap. Um, many of us will have uh, problems uh, with that uh, more generally. But within the uh, two-child cap, there was an exception for um, conceptions occurring as a result of um, rape. Um, and the concern then was that this exception couldn't be accessed because if there was a disclosure, um, there would then be uh, an obligation on the person to whom it was disclosed to go to the police and they wouldn't want to do that and this guidance was designed to address that discrete issue um, and what it does do is that um, it offers an interpretation firstly of section 5 and a broader human rights context essentially if you access if you uh, in order to access a benefit uh, indicates um, in general terms that you've been the victim of sexual crime and conception has resulted, um, that person is, in real terms, uh, at no risk whatever um, of uh, proceedings under Section 5. Okay. Dick.
Uh, thanks, Chair. Jo jo that was very clear, actually. Um, I, and you're right, I, I find the whole thing slightly disturbing that they brought this in the first place, that women have to actually um, disclose this. And so I find the whole process uh, slightly disturbing and, and uh, you know, I'm fully supportive of this, with the failure to disclose that it's not deemed as an Article 5 offence. But what is the follow-up to that? How, how do we still give support to the woman who goes in and does disclose that to uh, a qualifying officer? Um, what happens next? How do we then say, well, this woman still needs support um, uh, and there may still need to be an investigation because this could be somebody who's predatory, who has done this to this woman and could do it to other women. So how do we still give the support and still conduct an investigation, but at the same time protect the woman so she doesn't have that as an Article 5 offence? Does that make sense? Well, it does. I think there are two separate things, and I suppose it shows that when you over-legislate, and in many ways the universal credit legislation is the personal view, an example of over-legislation, you often create problems. Um, I mean, this is a problem that, that didn't need, on one view, to exist. Uh, and therefore, if a, a, a woman has been the victim of sexual crime, and that has had the consequence of um, conception, then um, there are other care and justice routes, of course, uh, open to her. This isn't designed um, to address that. It's designed to really address the fears of the um, the relevant professional to whom the disclosure is made, um, and I think the uh, the issue generally of um, care for women who have been the victim of sexual crime you know, is obviously something that, that um, you know needs um, our continued attention. What I would say is that the, the way in which we one hopes um, first and foremost do that is by having an effective criminal justice system, uh, effective uh, offences. Uh, in place and effective policing those offences so, so that um, people are deterred from committing them um, and that deterrence is, is followed through by effective police action when offences do take place and an effective criminal justice system which pushes the, the, um, the offences through the system as effectively and fairly as possible. Again, I, I, it was a huge advantage actually being present for the latter part of the, the DOJ presentation because Taking up a point that the chair made, there is an issue with the, the time taken to um, process cases in this jurisdiction, and, and, and one really can't put uh, a gloss on that. It really is as simple as that. Um, when one hears of uh, major incidents that take place uh, in England and Wales, it seems to be uh, an uncommonly short time before one's reading about the trial um, in the newspapers. That's not the position here. Typically, what happens is it, it's one reads about a trial and then dimly in the back of one's memory one recalls, oh yes, that took place two or three years ago. Um, and, uh, and I mention that because that's, that's particularly an issue in relation to sexual offences. And if I could just finish, I, just, I want to narrow this down a little bit if I can, John, please. So, so let me just, in my mind's eye, that the, the, the victim goes and, and, and makes a declaration to a qualifying officer um, okay, she's going to be, be, be exempt from, from it being an Article 5 offence, but what does the qualifying officer do? do? Is there still an onus on them to report it up? Do they still have? No, no, no they don't. They're, they're, they, Stops there. They're, 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 on the basis of this, they should have nothing to fear. But, but, the, yeah, but, it, but there's then just stop there. The point I'm saying is we now have a female who is vulnerable, yes. um, having been the victim of, of, of a sexual crime who has reported that to a qualifying officer, and that qualifying officer says, OK, everybody's protected. But what happens next? How do we make sure, as a duty of curve to that young woman, that we can protect her in some, in some way, or even point her for, 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 for support or guidance or something? So, so you see I do. Um, it's a, it's a undoubtedly an issue, but it will be you know, again, I remember many, many years ago in, in, in private practice um, appearing for a defendant in, in a rape case. And um, the case took a long time to come on, and the various stops and starts with the jury. And I remember speaking to um, the, a, a woman police officer uh, involved in the case and chatting generally. I said, look, if you don't mind me asking, if something like this happened to you, would you report it? And uh, she thought for a minute and said, no, I wouldn't. Um, now, 
that struck me as, uh, at the time and since, as um, both entirely understandable and entirely alarming that uh, a police officer um, to whom such a thing might happen would, would choose to take that course. Now, of course, obviously, one doesn't know what one does until um, you know, a disastrous uh, occurrence actually ensues. But I suppose the point is that nothing much is to be gained by um, shoving people into court or shoving people into police stations. Um, that's got to be um, their choice. Different considerations arise, um, and it's something certainly which we're going to have in the more general guidance, where if there's an issue of threat to uh, minors, uh, in which case then I'm afraid I would take the view that the, the, the personal feelings of the individual should rather yield to the, the, the more blindingly obvious public interest in ensuring that children uh, are protected. But we'll, we'll see that text in due course. So this is um, a very narrow piece of guidance. Um, and the issue that, that you raise, I think, you know, needs a, a broader uh, approach, and indeed one probably quite beyond the scope of, of this guidance, certainly. <laughs> Yeah, well, I agree. John. I, I think it absolutely does, and, and I have a real concern for uh, untrained qualifying officers who may get some quite disturbing information past them, and I've got nowhere to go with it. You know, and and it, it can be as bad on them as, as as it can be on the victim who brings that issue to in the first place. But you're right; it's, it seems very narrow. But I thank you, Chair. Well, one one of the organisations, as I understand it, that that is the qualified officer is Women's Aid. You're not in terms of. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so uh, I think to the point that you know that Doug's making in terms of what then support comes in, this this deals with the purely criminal justice end, does, not having to disclose does, uh, what then to help the, the the victim here to get that broader support. Yeah. And one of the organisations who has expertise in this yeah. that people go to is Women's Aid. So I, I'm making an assumption. I think we shouldn't. We can follow this up, but there would then be some kind of support. Package put in place within that organisation. I, I think, uh, it'd be a, if I may say so, Chair, a fairly safe assumption that, that Women's Aid w w would have a, a high degree of care yeah. for uh, its workers, uh, but of course that you know won't, won't apply in other contexts necessarily. Yeah. So. Paul Frey. Yeah, again, for fear of showing my ignorance in this, is, is Raymond's fear also. Um, so I'm right in saying this is a very narrow piece of legislation which protects workers who interface with the general public who then may well be rape victims. Does there have to be a criminal conviction? To no, class no, no not, not at all. I mean, th th this, this is uh, one of the points of this, yeah, that so um, if there's been a conviction, then obviously yeah. th there'd be no obligation to report the fact of conviction. Yes. This deals with those cases where typically one of the reasons why the elements of the offence won't be satisfied is because as well as there being, the lawyers say, an act as res, a number of physical acts, there's also a mens res, so there has to be a particular state of intention or recklessness on the part of the the perpetrator and of course that's a whole area of information which typically will never be placed in front of um, one of the officers in this context. Yeah. So, so does it affect social workers also? Does it protect social workers also? If that they are um, you know one of those to whom disclosures may be made in order to access the benefit, yes. Is there a, and again I'm, I'm just throwing these out here because of my ignorance, um, is there a fear or danger that there could be a situation arise, like a grooming gang in Bradford, or that that something like that could happen, and it not be detected, or someone doesn't detect something or report something due to this law. No, um, I, I think for two reasons. One, uh, as mentioned, um, with respect to the um, domestic abuse and stalking. This doesn't bind. So if someone said there'd be no, there's no nothing to prevent a person. So let's say, for example, I, um, as someone working in social security, um, receive disclosures, and then I get another one that sounds mm -hmm. very similar uh, from someone utterly unconnected with the first claimant, uh, and then perhaps the next week another. Uh, I'm protected if I don't 
Mm -hmm. But there's no reason why, as a citizen, I can't. Right, okay. So nothing to prevent me going to the police and saying, look, there seems to be something going on here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you. Rachel? Thank you. Um, certainly, I understand where this, this guidance is coming from. It's pretty horrific that we have to be here anyway. The fact that a rape clause is in Social Security legislation is yeah. pretty disgusting. Um, I note your comments on, on your report about going more widely with this guidance. Um, and but I'm saying about circulating it to enable others who may have an interest in or are affected by the work of the PPS to view this. Do you have any information or who you would foresee how this information getting out? Who's it going to? Is it going to be targeted? And, and when that, well, that could happen? Um, it's, it's published, this is published on our website, so uh, it's circulated uh, most obviously uh, that way. But I suppose the reference that I was making to, to more generally was uh, producing a piece of guidance which will essentially surpass this, which will be aimed at, um, I suppose, responding to the invitation in Sir John Gillan's report. Uh, to ensure that the people aren't uh, paralysed by fear, uh, because the big concern is, let's say someone um, plucks up the courage after several years to come forward. They say, "Well, hold on, you know, uh, I'm afraid of what, what I put myself on the wrong side of Section 5, um, and th that guidance will be designed to give reassurance um, about that. And, and I would hope that would have the widest possible um, circulation." So just to follow up on that, so the, the likes of those who are dealing with um, universal credit applications, or that they, they would sort of receive a copy of this or know about it. Uh, n no, it's not. I mean, the, the tricky thing, I suppose, is that the the guidance is addressed to criminal justice organisations. Yeah. So I can't give guidance to the, for example, social security agency. I can give guidance to the PPS and the PSNI. Um, and therefore, I, I've got to hope that um, by publishing it on the website and by ensuring that the, the bodies who will make the relevant decisions are aware of it, and indeed are obliged to have regard to its contents, that the, the results achieved. Thank you. Okay. Okay, members. If you're content, then I'll put the question formally to the committee that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2018 forward slash 110 the Attorney-General's Human Rights Guidance, the application of Section 5 of the Criminal Law Act, Northern Ireland, 1967, to rape victims and those to whom they may, uh, those to whom they make disclosures in connection with a claim for social security, child tax credit, or anonymous registration on the electoral roll order, Northern Ireland, 2018, <coughs> subject to the examiner's statutory rules report, has no objection to the rule. Agreed. Right. Okay, members. Um, the last statutory rule to consider, um, agenda item eight, pages 82 to 96 of your meeting pack. Again, uh, the rule is subject to uh, negative resolution. Um, <coughs> and uh, it's the Attorney General's human rights guidance on the use of the Irish language order in Northern Ireland. And I'll hand over to John. Well, um, the Good stuff to the end. Um, section, the section obligation on me um, relates to what are described in the statute as uh, international human rights standards. And during the passage um, of what would become the 2004 Act, um, David Trimble MP, as he then was, um, proposed an amendment confining it to um, international human rights treaties, you know, binding on the UK. And in one sense, that might have made my task uh, simpler. I would have produced possibly more straightforward, workable legislation, because the phrase international human rights standards is undefined and is at large. But even if he'd done that, and, and that might have improved the, the, um, the act, this would probably still have taken the, the form that it has because the um, Council of Europe um, Charter um, is a treaty um, to which the UK has signed up to, to which the UK has indicated it's bound. Uh, and of course the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 10 thereof, uh, is um, binding also in domestic law through uh, Section 6 of the Human Rights Act. And the, the larger ambition 
that um, I have for this guidance is to detoxify um, the language um, as an issue. And it's interesting that when I consulted with the um, PPS uh, and the police, and initially the proposal would have been to have guidance, this guidance also addressed to the prison service. I took the view even in advance of the consultation that the prison service might give rise to particular operational issues. Let's see, back to what I was saying about government being an experiment, let's see how this works with the PPS and PSNI first. And it was remarkable, in one sense, given the level of debate, political debate, uh, about the use of the Irish language, that there was no pushback um, of any material kind from the PPS, the PSNI. And in many ways, they indicated that um, they weren't bound to do it, but they very often um, delivered, in any event, the core of uh, what was here. Um, and I've also made it clear whenever I've been discussing this um, that this poses no um, fixed burden. Because you can see the structure of the guidance in terms of the considerations that could be taken into account and the various obligations that can be um, drawn down. And I've made it clear that Nothing in this guidance ever requires, insofar as there's ever a choice between investigating a burglary or doing something in this guidance, that the burglary gets ignored uh, in pursuit of uh, an element in this guidance. And uh, again, I was struck um, by something, uh, Chair, that your uh, party colleague, Minister Poot, said uh, on, on a radio programme. Uh, he indicated that he'd been uh, walking in uh, Newcastle, uh, had sought a public convenience, um, and there was one in Newcastle. It had um, dual uh, language signage, but was closed. Uh, and he expressed the view that many people would rather that the place was um, open. Um, I, I, and in a sense, with that broad public policy um, observation, I am in entire agreement. Um, let's deliver services. Um, and, um, and if there's ever a choice between delivering the service um, and not, well, let's prioritise the service. And the, the, the guidance puts it to the respective organisations to do that. And in many ways, the, the, the most important part of the, the, the guidance um, is the first paragraph. Um, the Irish language is an expression of the cultural wealth of Northern Ireland. And um, I'm entirely happy <coughs> that that is given legislative expression. Uh, it's also the uh, first time that um, Irish has been used in the title of a statutory text. And um, members with uh, uh, an interest in... Um, Philology um, will, will forgive me if I point out that the, the, the word um, pre attorney um, is not the word which is used in Bunrock na Heron um, for this office. But there's uh, two very important reasons for that. One, in, in earlier legislation um, of the Irish Free State, as it then was in the 1920s, um, that phrase is used. Uh, the 1937 Constitution creates a new office, which isn't a successor to the, the old office, uh, and therefore a different word is used. Okay, members, any questions? Can I just, have you any thoughts on how this may fit in with the work of the proposed Irish language commissioner? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, this was um, produced at a time when yes. the Irish Language Commissioner um, um, seemed quite some distance away. Um, so, uh, uh, indeed, th th we need to see what's actually in the text um, of the new bills. Um, uh, this um, 
sits entirely separately from that. It's produced um, pursuant to uh, an entirely different statute responsibility, Section 8 of the 2004 Act. So um, the, 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 the language commissioner, when she or he comes, um, uh, will you know, do his or her own thing in relation to the framework that then exists. But this is quite a, a, a separate um, piece of work. And it's interesting that, that um, relatively early on, um, you know, the, I emphasise no pushback from the two organisations, but it's also been welcomed by uh, Conor and Agelga. Mm -hmm. And is it a, it is an, an, as it stands, it, it becomes obviously a legal document? Yes. As such? Yes. Yeah. Because it's been operational from October 2019. See that? Yeah. Which isn't very long. But um, so that there will be a, a legal obligation under the organisation. The obligation back. is to have regard to this. To have regard. So um, even though it's phrased in terms of some detail, the obligation under Section 8 is to have regard to the legislation. So it's not, no one um, breaches the law by um, deciding, well, I'm, I'm, I consider what's here, but I'm not doing it. And that's even in respect of an obligation, which when they go through the process, which this guide just contemplates, they then don't do it, um, as long as they have regard to it. That's why no one, no police officer at whatever rank will ever have to decide, oh my goodness, well, I can't investigate that burglary because I've got, I've got to do something in the guidance. <clears throat> So it poses no operational clog. I mean, again, there are two schools of thought in relation to human rights. One is sees human rights as essentially as a as a tripwire uh, or as a minefield, uh, and the the unwary public official walks through at the risk of of detonating um, a mine. Uh, the other is the hand on the shoulder, um, and that competent professionals who are living up to the very highest standards of their discipline will, in very many cases, be entirely human rights compliant. And so this is designed to be the, the hand on the shoulder rather than the, you know, I don't know what the technical term is, the sewing of a field with mine, whatever. <laughs> I defer to Captain Beatty. <laughs> um, but that's the point. Um, and um, it, it's... Um, very much a, a, a matter for them to, and it also that it, it's instructive. I think that there wasn't pushback from the two organisations, and that in many ways they're doing this already. They're not producing a vocabulary as this, this uh, text suggests, but they're, they're, if someone writes even before this to the PPS, um, ask Ilga, there was a fair chance they would get a reply. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So it's. I know, Gordon, and you've clarified that. Um, there, there's guidance. You know, when we're going to have to deal with the legislation that comes through <coughs> the Assembly in terms of language commissioner will do and standards and so on. It's very <coughs> clearly outlined the process for that. Um, but ultimately, this is guidance that it has is. to be given regard to. That's right. It's not, uh, and you're not in a position to say, you must. No. This is now the law. No. It's guidance, and they'll give regard to it because there's aspects of it too. I don't have an issue with, but I know there are other aspects to this um, that I would take issue with. Um, but because it's not the law, and it has to be given regard to, um, I'm content to let it go with that. Um, but we've clarified that point anyway, which I was I knew that to be the case. But Doug. Yeah, John. Just, uh, yeah. I mean, it's guidance, and uh, I mean, it, it does take a, a, a fair degree of, of looking at this and, and trying to see it with a, a sort of objective eye. Um, one thing that jumps out at me, though, and it, it just concerned me an, an awful lot. Uh, each organisation has developed Irish language capacity by offering training, including mm -hmm. incentivised training. Um, incentivised could mean so much. Does incentivised mean you can't progress to the next rank unless you have completed this training? Um, so, so that concerns me slightly. Well, um, it, would I that be in conflict with something else? It almost certainly would, because obviously nothing in this changes the law. Uh, it has to, regard has to be paid to it, yeah. but it doesn't change the law. So I would imagine that the, the, the highly regulated 
um, structure of police rank and progression within rank uh, would provide for what is relevant and by implication what isn't. So um, I, I would, that's, that's unthinkable um, in, in my view. But incentivisation in general could be either as much or as little, depending on, on one's view, as a couple of extra leave days to go to course. But the key thing is the organisation has to decide to do that. Uh, it doesn't have to decide to do that. Uh, and even if it decides to do it, um, it doesn't breach the law if it doesn't do it in any particular case. Okay. Okay. Okay, members, I would formally put the question that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2019 forward slash 138, the Attorney General's Human Rights Guidance, the use of the Irish Language Order Northern Ireland 2019, and subject to the Examiner Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Okay. Guilty of leash. Go with that. You may be the only one that can read out the proper title. No, I, I was I was panicking in case you'd ask me. I'm a well rehearsed. I'm a well rehearsed. Well 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 say that over there too. <laughs> Attorney General, can I thank you for coming to the committee? As, as always, a pleasure. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, members, we'll, we'll move on, and hopefully we'll get through the rest uh, quickly. Uh, draft committee forward work program, pages 98 to 104 of the meeting pack. The overview briefings on the various Department of Justice directors and key agencies will continue over the next uh, couple of weeks. Arra arrangements have been made for the Chief Constable to attend the meeting on Thursday, the 13th of February, uh, to outline the PSNI budget position and key policing priorities and challenges. So, before next week, um, if there are issues that you want to be raising with the Chief Constable, if you can feed that through to the committee staff um, next week, we will kind of finalise the broad areas that we would like to discuss and then we can provide uh, those uh, areas in advance to the Chief Constable in order that we get as much out of it as possible. So if you can do that um, for next Thursday, then we'll be able to finalise uh, that presentation. A written briefing on a legislative consent motion for Criminal Finances Act 2017 is scheduled for the 20th of February and the Minister for Justice will be attending the meeting on the 27th. Of February. So, Chair, can I take you back there to one of the widest items of discussion for Chief Constable? Could, could I ask that the committee put down on that the Chair protects the Scooter Scheme? Because at the very least, what that will do is prompt him to get a, a report on it and see where it's at, because they were to uh, relaunch it uh, at the start of this year. Okay. Members, if I can just seek your agreement that the LCM briefing should be an oral briefing rather than a written briefing. The, the uh, LCM on the Criminal Finances Act, that, that relates to the unexplained wealth orders, uh, and I personally would rather have officials here to be able to quiz them on that rather than just to receive a yep. written briefing. Um, if you're content then with the forward work programme for February, Subject to the change on the LCM briefing, then we'll agree that. Agreed. Mm. Great. Uh, pages three and four of your table pack is a copy of the Minister's mm. press release confirming her intention to bring domestic abuse legislation through the Assembly, and a copy of <coughs> an Assembly <coughs> research paper on the criminalisation mm. of coercive control. This outlines mm. the different approaches taken in the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland, summarises the emphasis placed on coercive control by government led strategy in each jurisdiction and it sets out the available statistical data on the prevalence of this type of abuse. Um, so if members are content, we'll write to the Minister and we'll ask uh, for details of the time frame for legislation going to the Executive and then introduced to the Assembly. I know officials did indicate April May. Um, I would have anticipated that that should come earlier. I didn't go into it, but this committee did pass much more substantive legislation in a much shorter time frame than what Andy, Anthony Harbison was indicating. Um, but I would rather see the extent of the legislation. The committee will then look at what, what is necessary given what happened before. Um, but members made, uh, I think, very valid points around the time frame of this. Um, we need to get the legislation, though, before we can really come to a view as to how quickly we can do it uh, while still carrying out the proper rule that we need to carry out. So 
we will formally write to the Minister indicating that we want to, to get time frames and for her department to expedite this as soon as possible. Uh, also, if members are content, we will commission a research paper on any new or emerging approach, approaches in the other jurisdictions, including Scotland, England and Wales and the Republic of Ireland, uh, on tackling domestic violence and abuse, <coughs> in particular the creation or use of other offences that are in addition to coercive control. So if we can agree to do that today, it will just allow that work to start rather than um, waiting. Great. Agreed. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Correspondence. There's four, item, four items of correspondence in the meeting pack, one in the table pack. I'll just uh, draw attention to two of them. Um, the uh, British Association for Shooting and Conservation has asked for the committee to consider a proposal to amend Schedule 1A of the Firearms Order 2004 to add additional calibres of firearms that may be exchanged in a one-off, one-on transaction carried out in firearms dealers' premises. Some members will be fully aware of the length of time the committee <laughs> here we, here we go again. handled <laughs> this yeah, issue. Um, but uh, if members are agreed, um, it is something that is, uh, has regional implications yeah. um, that we'll forward that correspondence. We'll ask for an update, first of all, from the department uh, in, in terms of what it is that they're, they're seeking, and then we'll come back to the issue as a committee. Can I just say on that, Chair, it's a credit to this committee and the members on the committee. Um, when we, when we actually solved an issue that had dogged the department for many, many years, uh, and they were quite resistant of the work that this committee did, and we pushed it through, and we, we cajoled them and did what we had to do in order to get a resolution. I don't see it being any different this time, so I agree no. with the, 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 the uh, proposed actions. Yes, but we have some background information. I know BSC have been, they've been speaking to number of members about this, but what has happened is there's been a couple or three new calibers right. have become very popular. These are new calibers developed by, I think it's Hornady or something like that, and um, like for rim fire and centre fire, and it's a simple matter of updating that to keep it more contemporary with what sports people out there are using. And of course there is a miscellaneous bell coming up. Oh. Yeah, that's right. This may be a, a, a simple legislative change, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. as opposed to to requiring primary legislation. Okay, um, well, we'll get the update anyway um, from the department. Also then, uh, some correspondence in respect of the rescue plan to secure the future of the uh, radar centre, which is the Risk Avoidance and Danger Awareness Resource Centre. Some members will recall, I think we did go and visit that centre. It is subsequently closed um, just at the end of last year due to funding pressures. Uh, the Radar Centre was a life-sized interactive safety skills education centre in Belfast. It had been used uh, to teach tens of thousands of children and young people about road, fire, home and transport safety. It had a full-sized street scene with a house, bus, train, fire station, courtroom, prison cell, shop, a boat, and, and so it goes on. An excellent resource um, that, that has been used extensively again. Uh, this item, given the regional significance of it, I'm content that that correspondence that we would now seek an update from the department um, as to what they're doing in respect of, of, of that issue, and I'm sure it's something the committee will, will want to follow up on. Say, um, does some, if not all of this, did it not come from the policing budget, the yes, SNI budget? Yeah. So it may be something we could ask the Chief Constable, Constable. about yeah. next week. Just to give a bit of information on that, that was the issue. Mm -hmm. That it was coming out of the policing budget, and that was not the initial intention. It was right. to, to come out of the justice. got the justice, and because that's that's why it closed down because yeah. the the PSNA had actually extended that for a year, yeah. and to allow justice to have a bit of time to sort themselves out and, and mm. give the the budget to it, which they didn't right. do. So I think the update is going to be they're doing nothing. Okay, well, that's what they've done. Also. Sir, just on that, I would endorse what's been said. It's an excellent resource. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure those have been there. I think it's oh, something right. we should try and uh, lobby for and continue to, to yes. try and revive it. Absolutely. Now, it's, uh, it's located in a good, easy, accessible area, and I think it's, uh, it is you know, something that I think should be uh, supported and encouraged, and I'm sure funding could be found from some departments. So, I think as a committee, I'm sure we will uh, support that and try and encourage other departments to get involved. And we appreciate it. It probably was quite a, a liability on the police, but mm -hmm. perhaps they could be part funders towards it. 
Um, continuation of it. Paul? Yeah, there's a wider issue here, Chair. And that is the burden being placed on more than one department mm. uh, and, and uh, the burden <coughs> being shared, and it never seems to work. I can name you a whole lot of projects, namely the Railway uh, Drug Addiction Centre, whereby Health and Justice funded it, and I can't remember now, but one of them pulled the plug on the funding and left, oh, it, left it to the... And, and it does not work in this shape and form. Now, it might change with a programme for government and, and being pushed to go down that road, but I have a problem also then with what we've heard today about the, the redress panel committee, uh, and that could end up having problems down the road too. So it's a bigger, wider principle, uh, and I think we need to nail it. Uh, so, yeah, I think we need to be asking for an update, not only of the police, but then why then the Justice Department, why did they uh, remove the funding? Okay, well, listen, we'll, we'll seek the update and we can come back to, to that issue. Um, Chairman's Business, uh, invite from the Bar Council to meet with them. I'm assuming they've been corresponding with other members of the committee as well. I'll meet them as uh, Chair of the Committee. I know they've also asked to meet with my colleagues, um, Paul and Gordon, so... Um, it's just there to note um, an invitation to the CCTV monitoring suite in Lisburn and Castlereagh. Definitely, I'll take that one up. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go. I'll go to that one. Um, any other business? Well, if there's no other business. Yep. Um, I'm not. Your information public yet? Not yet. Okay. Okay. Well, listen. We will uh, conclude the meeting and we'll meet next Tuesday. It's at two o'clock that we're going to have the committee meeting to go through the statutory rules. Um, that'll be held in this room, two o'clock on Tuesday. Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly 